uh, people don't join because you push to the government is that you have a lot of people and then therefore you then push the government exactly which i think is what Saul is trying to do he's saying build up your base get it big and then you can push the government i say yes look look at this book as uh, sort of it's it's like a guide on how to build a weapon it, it's telling you how to build it it's not telling you who Whoa. to aim it at yeah. I, I like his weapons but uh I, I don't know if i like where he's pointing the gun Hello everyone, yeah. and welcome to the first edition of Flipping Through. Today, we are going to be going over Rules for Radicals, as written by Saul Olinsky. And, let's have some introduction of the crowd that we got going on here. I am Captain Rastrero, I am also known as Jose here, by my lovely friends, and I'll be the one Absolutely. doing the actual flipping. Flipping through or flipping off? Hello, my name is Garth. Um... As or Gartham, I per, I can be called either one, and I will be your reader for the evening. He does a fantastic job, David. You sound so professional, Goth. <laughs> Hello, you. so I'm David. <laughs> your whole nation. <laughs> Hello, I'm David Aragon. I'm mostly known for my stupid animations, but I'm also not so stupid myself. Excellent, enlightened centrist. Great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm enlightened centrist, and yeah, I'm known in the PSA Sitch community because I make PSA Sitch and Adam friended memes, I guess. Amazon. <laughs> well, yeah, last day and leastly is me. Wait, it's still got psycho mate in Stanton. <laughs> not last. What do you mean? Oh, <laughs> damn it. I thought I was. You're not even worth There's mentioning. There's so many fucking people. Yeah. But I am here. I'm Lieutenant Amazil, and I am just here to listen and goof. Because I don't really know much. I'm not very literal, despite the fact that I make comics. Psychomate, yeah, what's up with you, bud? Oh, hi. I'm Psychomate. I, uh, I guess, um, am I known He's for anything? He's unimportant. Yeah. Okay, we'll go. My name is Stanton. Hi. I'm an ex-jet skier Stanton. here in California. And uh, I love all the politics, all the uh, philosophy and the history behind all this type of stuff. So I'm here to put my input and see how, see how I can relate it to today. Hi, I'm Al. I'm a jackass. Yes. Yeah, you were. Anyway. All right, Alex, start us off then. Uh, but anyway, prologue. what are we doing? Anyway. Of course, anyway. as it's completely anyway. capitalized and I need to be my jackass self. The, um... The revolutionary force. Bitch. Today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there we go. Uh, the revolutionary force today has two targets, moral as well as material. Its young protagonists are one moment reminiscent of the idealistic early Christians, yet they also urge violence and cry, burn the system down. They have no illusions about the system, but plenty of illusions about the way to change our world. It is to this point that I have written this book. These words are written in desperation, partially because it is what they do and will do that will give meaning to what I and the radicals of my generation have done with our lives. They are now the vanguard, and they had to start almost from scratch. Few of us survived the Joe McCarthy Holocaust of the early 1950s, and of those, there were even fewer whose understanding and insights had developed beyond the dialectical materialism of orthodox Marxism. My fellow radicals, who were supposed to pass on the torch of experience and insights to a new generation, just were not there. As the young looked at the society around them, it was all, in their words, materialistic, decadent, bourgeois in its values, bankrupt and violent. Is it any wonder that they rejected us in Toto? See, I... Um, Toto. What is Toto? Africa, the song. Right. Oh, I bless the yeah, you know the musician, Africa. Toto. Africa. Uh, and no, it's called up, Jose. Yeah. Scroll up. Yeah, 
Yep. So that way we I, all I have a problem with still they still have no you know, illusions people... about the system. But plenty of illusions about the way to change yeah, the world. Yeah, it is. Okay. Sure, they do have illusions about the way to change the world, but it it almost seems as if there is no appreciation for the way that the system is properly functioning. Or at, or at the very least, he's pointing out a particular group of people it, that actually, it. like, basically the people that know a lot, but don't do anything about it. I think what he means is that, in his views, he's a radical and he wants to change the system. And he thinks that the next generation of radicals, they also think, okay, the system has to change. But um, they, he fears that they try they to know. make change in the wrong way. They don't know how to do it or what is the sensible way or the right way to do that. Yeah, and it's because, so, and he explains that yeah. it's because the older generation of radicals ever taught them or showed them the way how they did it. Then their days with roses and barrels and fucking. I do find it disingenuous that he um, compares the Holocaust with, well, the the Joe McCarthy trials, which you could more. Mm, it, it it would be more accurate to describe yeah. them as witch hunts, maybe. But Holocaust, it's just it's it's poisoning yeah, the well I in think my so opinion. Well. well, I yeah. think he I think he uses well he uses the word Holocaust with a, a lowercase h, so he's not talking about that specific event. I don't think. I think he's using the definition of Holocaust, meaning like a mass destruction of something. So he's being hyperbolic okay. about the McCarthy trials in using yeah, the word maybe still. the word holocaust back then wasn't that associated with this specific in incident yeah but still yeah, you it know it brings the... up this very specific imagery and i feel like yeah the word the proper word he was looking for probably was sure. like persecution okay. which is what it was right it was yes political yes. persecution i yep the, the thing so, about uh, you think he did it on purpose using that word to give yeah, it like, like an extra punch. Yeah, it's like people mm -hmm, today using mm -hmm, racist mm -hmm. and not using the defini the correct definition. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure like nowadays you'll probably find some people that, well, oh, <laughs> uh, some uh, Israelites who would claim that the blacks, they would compare the persecution and the enslavement and abuse of black people to the Holocaust. <clears throat> hmm. Damn Israelites. Right. Yeah. Stanton, you wanted to say something? Uh, the, uh, the use of the hyperbolic words is part of the uh, lingual uh, propaganda. He's trying to conjure up feelings and associate them with other instances. So um, feelings of the Holocaust are obviously something horrific and, and horrible. And uh, when you start reading the book, he wants you to think of this is what you're fighting. This is something horrible that you're up mm. against. And uh, framing the book and how you're fighting these, these, these horrible atrocities that we've, we're up against and how to push forward past them into the future. So it's really uh, an, an early kind of... Um, glimpse into some of the tactics that I believe he's going to go into. Yeah, I into definitely the believe there's a lot of yeah. propaganda and manipulation of words going on here. It's, um, it is absolutely hyperbolic. It's, it's but, definitely Saul trying to give his own perspective on things, too. Like, he's, uh, like, it's, it, it, it's definitely the author talking to the audience at this point. So, what he, um, like, He's saying that, you know, these people have not passed down to the next generation and they kind of become mm. lost activists, so to speak. Which I think is, like, it's his main audience, right? His his main audience for this book are, I guess what you would say, radicals? But in a, in I mean, a more... That makes sense, based on title. Right, exactly. Yeah. I'm good. All I would say okay. is that it goes back to what I initially said. It's all about imagery. He's trying to implant the imagery of 
how they felt it was back in the hippie times about what their their for what they felt of their form of persecution opposed as opposed to what may be happening now or what may be happening in the future and is in the time I of would this just way. like to say oh Jose you added Madagascar you can't forget about Madagascar I like the <laughs> right the <laughs> Africa looks amazing let's go yes Okay. All right. <laughs> Today's generation is desperately trying to make some sense out of their lives and out of the world. Most of them are products of the middle class. They have rejected their materialistic backgrounds, the goal of a well-paid job, suburban home, automobile, country club membership, first-class travel, status, security, and everything that meant success to their parents. They have had it. They watched it lead their parents to tranquilizers, alcohol, long-time endurance marriages or divorces, high blood pressure, ulcers, frustration, and the disillusionment of the good life. They have seen the almost unbelievable idiocy of our political leadership. In the past, political leaders, ranging from the mayors to governors to the White House, were regarded with respect and almost reverence. Today, they are viewed with contempt. This negativism now extends to all institutions, from the police and the courts to the system itself. We are living in a world of mass media which daily exposes society's innate hypocrisy, its contradictions, and the apparent failure of almost every facet of our social and political life. The young have seen their activist participatory democracy turn into its antithesis, nihilistic bombing and murder. The political panaceas of the past, such as revolutions in Russia and China, have become the same old stuff under a different name. The search for freedom does not seem to have any road or destination. The young are inundated with a barrage of information and facts so overwhelming that the world has come to seem an utter bedlam, which has them spinning in a frenzy, looking for what man has always looked for from the beginning of time, a way of life that has some meaning or sense. A way of life means a certain degree of order where things have some relationship and can be pieced together into a system that at least provides some clues to what life is about. Men have always yearned for and sought direction by setting up religions, inventing political philosophies, creating scientific systems like Newton's, or formulating ideologies of various kinds. This is what is behind the common cliche, getting it all together. Despite the realization that all values and factors are relative, fluid, and changing, and that it will be possible to get it all together only relatively. The elements will shift and move together just like the changing pattern in a turning this, kaleidoscope. This right kind of reminds me part. of, of uh, yes. a quote from the late Ravi Zacharias. And I know I'm going to misrepresent it very, very badly. This is Just a Thought with Ravi Zacharias. Many years ago, I had the privilege of doing an open forum at Ohio State University, and um, we were being driven to the venue for that night, and it was a businessman driving us past a new building, and he said, this is the Wexner Center for the Arts. Time Magazine has described this as America's first postmodern building. The architect believed, since life itself has no purpose and meaning, why should our buildings have any purpose and meaning? So he designed the building without any particular purpose in mind. I said, did he do that with a foundation as well? Or did he have to follow certain guidelines because the infrastructure can look magnificent, but if the foundation doesn't hold, the whole thing will collapse. Oh, yeah. Mm, true. And you can tell that this was written basically for Generation X, yeah. which sort of did look at their parents with a, in a way that it's like you failed yeah. us, in a sense, and we don't want your your style of life. When I'm I'm assuming many many men mostly nowadays do want. <laughs> that sort of boomer lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought too. Yeah. It's kind of funny because you said, okay, um, they are middle class children and they they reject the 
the lifestyle they reject the um the, mm -hmm. the golf clubs or something like that and that the lifestyle of the parents had led them to yeah be miserable and it seems like the thing i thought was you can be rich and live in the system without doing all that stuff you know what i mean you can be a rich person who who is not in the um long term endurance marriage or divorce and and doesn't have high blood pressure um and doesn't drink alcohol all the time you know what i mean the the yeah. lifestyle the people um yeah. that i had the rich it's lifestyle in that way um, yeah I'm it sure. seems like he's. It seems like he's casting a white net just so he can reach a lot of people. Huh. In my opinion, I don't know mm. if it's I, wide. I don't know. It's. I mean, it. It. I. I. Yeah. I. Yeah. I would question that too because he's. He's talking about like very very specific people, right? He's. I think he's talking about like parents who basically have all the material stuff they want and then they're just con yeah. con uh, content with life and they just don't feel like they have to do anything else yeah but but he associates it with the lifestyle and with having all that stuff i think well his his I, main at least i think that is what many communists today do or anarchists they see their parents and they they maybe work all day they are not there and they have money, but they're basically, in their eyes, a victim of capitalism. So they see the lifestyle of their parents and they associate that with capitalism. They say, oh, capitalism is bad. We need to tear the system down. But th his parents could make, let's say, better decisions while still being in a capital uh, capitalist yeah, system. It's you know what I mean? It's passing so, the blame. Um, why should you, you you don't have to go to oh we need to yeah burn the system down to um, yeah change the things that he said that uh, that the parents did that were bad. It's passing the blame of a human condition onto a system that humans created. Unless I'm incorrect, is uh, I don't know. No, I think you're onto something. It's yeah. He's, right, yeah. he's really talking about it's like a crisis of meaning, right? So if you're like mm. these type of people who are rich and have a lot of materialistic, like how he said, a materialistic background, then you're not really struggling. You're not really seeking anything. Mm. You're just right. being, living a hedonistic lifestyle all the time with no meaning. I mean, I kind of don't see the problem with being content. I mean, isn't that what a society longs for? Being content? Yeah. Yeah. What is it, what the, um, yeah. Y yes and no. It depends what you mean by content. If by content means that you have, like, I don't know, it really just depends. Because if you're talking about content on a material basis, that's the exact thing that he's mm -hmm. critiquing in this book, right? So yeah. he's saying that even all the parents who have all the stuff, like, are not really seen as people that are really content anymore because they have tranquilizers, alcohol, divorces, high blood pressure, so on and so forth. Is that... Yeah, they're content in one way, but in one way they're also making their own selves suffer. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, um, when I say content, it's more like a, it's like a societal thing, but I guess, you know, as a radical, he wouldn't see things that way. Oh, yeah, It's worth right. asking. There's no way you can be content with any with life or the system as a radical. It's well, just not. It's worth asking that if those problems, those very specific problems, are solved with, you know, being radical. I don't think so. Well, he's, well, I, I would say this, because I think this will help give a little perspective. Saul Linsky isn't a radical, mm. he's a political scientist, hmm. is a better way to think about it. So, he's analyzing this situation and seeing, okay, how can I get these activists who, like, and he probably thinks that they are doing good things, but they're just not mobilized, so to speak. But doesn't he say my fellow radicals, implying yeah. that he's one mm -hmm. of them? Um, he said that they continue his work, so... I, he can be so, both, right? Yes, he can be yeah, radical, right, but also... Yes. So, yeah. We've yes, established... 
that he has a very deep um what would you call it um investment yeah he, he identifies himself with the left because he starts by saying the the Joe McCarthy's holocaust <laughs> so like you know forgive me for not thinking well, the best the, of him but <laughs> Joe McCarthy's holocaust also what is the flip side of that what if Joe McCarthy actually did root out people that were trying to subvert the system? I'll uh, tell you what, he didn't sure. succeed. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. You never leave the, the job half now. done. No Absolutely. more half measures. Look at measures. the universities now. Evergreen. Come on. Well, there's, there, there's a lot of things that get suggested that, you know, do not apply to today's activists, so to speak. So... It would be really interesting if they actually yeah. read this book. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, it. I, I mean, I guess, I guess that's me going a little forward in the book. It would make them more effective, which I hope they don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing we're going through it, flipping through it. Um, I was, I was thinking about the point that Alex said that they blaming the system for a human problem or what did you exactly say it, it's passing do you remember passing blame rather than recognizing that humanity has a flaw within it you know because it's messy it's evolutionary i guess to expand on it a little bit it, it rather than taking That's on personal think, responsibility you know? for the flaws of yeah. humanity not flaws but you know detriments um things that are ne not necessarily good for society and then, you know, blaming the system for that instead of really realizing in yourself what's going on. Well, yeah. well, Saul Alinsky's solution to that would be to to do something about it, basically. Okay. But to be smart about it, too. Again, this is me going a little ahead, but that, mm -hmm. that would that be would his be. diagnosis. I like it. Yeah. Also, I would say that um, with the whole freaking idea of the middle class and the youth kind of rebelling because of their parents and seeing the turmoil. I don't think it's necessarily just that they see the turmoil that richness has created. It's, again, uh, this is something that you mentioned earlier, but uh, with the mm -hmm. crisis of meaning and that that's just something that's natural. I mean, every, I think in every generation, we have looked down upon our elders in a way or we wanted to rebel and be different, to express ourselves and see, mm -hmm. be something more and than that's that. That's a pretty good reaction yeah. to have right. because it's just going to, if it's implemented in the right way, it's going to improve society. Like how he associates the... Um, Living at, or living in a middle class life, materialistic background type stuff, with uh, it leading to uh, use drug use, alcohol, marriages, and divorce, and health issues, and all of that. Um, it, it seems like that's kind of a leap to take to be like, oh look, people have these problems. Let's um, let's just say it is the middle class that does it. it it really kind of it dodges the solution and uh, he says down here the negativism now extends to all institutions and he kind of frames being negative in a positive light mm -hmm. in this way so he's really looking at how um, this you know, it's not a constructive criticism it's a destructive criticism and he sees that as a positive and he's trying to push it push it forward and this is the the kind of what what makes a uh, a radical essentially. I don't know. I think he's going again. He's uh, what is it? He the Youngs have seen their activist participatory democracy turn into its antithesis: nihilistic bombing and murder. So his I I think his ideal that he wants for for people living in a society is that he wants people to participate in a democracy, but not only that, but be able to organize. Mm -hmm themselves around certain issues sure mm. it's true. Yeah, they're not fighting for the they're not fighting for the right things 
Well, yeah, it, it, it completely depends on about what, what the thing they're fighting for is specifically. But, um, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not geared toward, I mean, yeah. I think we're getting a little ahead, but it, it, it's, it's not geared towards one or the other. I do, I'll, I'll say this last thing, uh, he, like, saying that the all values and factors are fluid, relative, and changing, mm -hmm. s some of it is mm -hmm. true, and some of it isn't, to be I honest. To talk about um, this, yeah. Oh, sure, go ahead. I mean, yeah, I just wanted to have a discussion about this, because it seems to me like he's very, making a very, he's making a leap of of judgment here, like, he's, I, I, what I see this as is he's saying that morality is subjective, right here. He's making the leap of faith that morality is subjective, so we should ignore, like, what's right today. Uh, I don't, yeah. I don't know if I go as far as reality. Um, he's, I think he's just saying, uh, like, the getting it all together. So he's critiquing that. I mean, I mean that morality, I mean morality, not, not reality. Oh, yeah, I heard okay. morality. Oh, sorry. My bad. Um, uh, let's see. Getting all together. Uh, maybe. I hmm. I don't know. I, I, I would have to think about that a little more. If, if, if mean, what he means by getting it all together is talking about how to be a moral person, then maybe. Or well, it's well, just look what how he says next. Look what he says next. Despite the realization that all values and factors are relative, fluid, and changing. Yes, all, okay. All values. Yeah. Yeah, he he uses the word value, so yes, then yeah, it is. Yeah, this is somewhat of more relativism, making it a social, uh, in a sense. Oh, I just wanted to bring up that I'm very surprised how much this like some parts of this paragraph like still stand. Oh yeah, uh, like yeah. oh, uh, the young have a barrage of information and facts that are so overwhelming that the world has seemed under bellum and it has them spinning in a frenzy. Yeah, that, that's pretty accurate. And, I mean, and, and the, the internet didn't, far off. And the internet didn't, yeah. didn't even exist when this book came out. So. Yeah, he was talking oh. about the fucking printing press at the time. How would he react today? Oh my god. I have a problem <laughs> with the the way that getting it all together is treated. Like there is a positive side to getting it all together. Yeah, I mean, put your house in perfect order. It's, it's neglecting something. Of course you're going to have angst. Of course you're going to have existential suffering and problems in life. Getting it all together is not the cause of that. Getting it all together is, is a form of solution to that. Right. I, I would say when, when you have the solution and you finally get it all together, until then, you're working on it. Exactly. I think he's just saying, like, relative to the, the values, uh, finger, finger quotes, the values of the time. So if getting it all together back in the, whenever this book was written, 1971, was it? 71? Okay. No, 71. Right. 71. Well, yeah, back then it was like, you know, white picket fence, watch the car on Sundays, church on, uh, watch the car on Saturdays, church on Sundays, you know. That was getting it all together, but, you know, maybe he's saying that that is, like, not conducive to being a radical, I guess? I don't know. I'm rambling. Does I understand you, correctly? I think he's saying that it's not good enough. And that that in itself, uh, even the ideal living, the ideal life, at least at the time, mm -hmm. was not as, it's not perfect. It still had its faults. And that, and so it still needed change. It still, there was still more that yep. needed to be done. It could be that he's uh, satirizing a, a, a uh, an arrogant uh, objectivism uh, based on the, pr the sentence before it, because he lists religion, political philosophies, scientific systems, and ideologies. So it, it could be in that way, and then he shifts it to relativism or uh, or social. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you could say that a uh, form of hyper individualism leads to societal problems that get ignored by people who are too focused on themselves and so um, everything sort of gets corrupted around them and so I would agree with that but uh, at the same time um, finding uh, meaning in life by virtue of changing the system I think that's good but 
uh, you're not gonna really be that good at it if you don't if you're not a competent person to begin with so you do have to work on yourself first that that would be my argument against his in, in this case yeah radicalism does have a problem with practicality well yeah and that's what I mean that's what the book is for okay all right let's go let's in the past, the world, whether in its physical or intellectual terms, was much smaller, simpler, and more orderly. It inspired credibility. Today, everything is so complex as to be incomprehensible. What sense does it make for men to walk on the moon while other men are waiting on welfare lines? Or in Vietnam, killing and dying for a corrupt dictatorship in the name of freedom? These are the days when man has his hands on the sublime while he is up to his hips in the muck of madness. The establishment, in many ways, is as suicidal as some of the far left, except that they are infinitely more destructive than the far left can ever be. The outcome of the hopelessness and despair is morbidity. There is a feeling of death hanging over the nation. I think there's a lack of self-awareness within that. Uh. The establishment, in many ways, <laughs> is as suicidal as some of the far left. Okay, sure. Except they are infinitely more destructive. No, I can't agree with that. I um, think he's talking about the far left inside the country, like not well, compared to the far left in in Russia or China. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and also, the remember, this looking is, at uh, the system at the moment. Yeah, and remember, at the moment, at this point, is the seventies. So we're still in that mindset. When yeah. we're talking about far left, we're probably thinking of like Black Panthers, Malcolm X, and that sort of thing. Right. Right. And. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I guess. Uh, now nah, you go ahead. <laughs> I forgot. Oh, I was just going to say. Um, yeah. And again, he's addressing a specific group of radicals, who, which he uh, talks about later on how they're just not very efficient. Like, he, he just doesn't see them as, like, people that can do anything in the current time um, because they're somewhat unorganized in a way. But he fears the establishment a lot more because it is or it's something that's already established. So if, if mm -hmm. the establishment makes a mistake, he sees that as dangerous. But if the far left makes a mistake, then in his own view, it's like, oh, whatever, they're just some uh, political group. That because of their experience, it's natural that they make a mistake. Yes. And they don't have the political power. Yeah, that too, because... That's, that's, I think that's... Yeah, that's it. They don't rule the country. I, I do agree with him that the outcome of the hopelessness and despair is morbidity. That, that, that line is fairly accurate. And not just... I mean, for... For to any the for of nihilism? any time, yeah. Is that what he's? Is that what he's pushing? I mean, yeah, that's being yeah, demoralized it, yeah, leads to substance abuse and who, all that. Who gave us a right? Exactly. To wipe away the entire horizon. Frederick Nietzsche. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I find it kind of interesting that. Uh, what what sense does it make to men walk on the moon while others are waiting in welfare lines? I, I wonder if, given the hindsight of how much technology has come from mm -hmm. the mission to the moon and how much prosperity has been gained from that, how many people we've actually gotten off of welfare lines because of the technology that was created and established at that time, I, I mean, it, it must be into the millions of people. So looking back now... He would have to say, hey, look, there was sense that for it to make. And having it be kind of a, uh, that lack of foresight at the time will kind of feels like that's how he, he looks at the system, is yeah. there's, there's no way for it to actually become better from itself. It has to exactly. be something on the outside to come in to change it, to fix it, to make it the good thing. It's not just mm -hmm. something that will happen over time, and, and you'll see it 
grow better. And, and it's obvious that it does grow better over time. This is that's, the, that's how, our, how the nation was established. Yeah. If I could add to that, if I could add to that, uh, the space, the space uh, race created also a lot of jobs. I told this, this anecdote last time we, we were at the prologue, uh, oh, allegedly. Yeah. And uh, I used to work at an office and I used to bring my NASA jacket with me that I got at the oh, nice. National Air and Space Museum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the janitor one day, he just casually told me, yeah, that jacket is fake. And I was like, what do you mean? I bought it at the Air and Space Museum. And he's like, yeah, the, NAS- the actual NASA jacket, the patch isn't fleece. It's a, it's a sewn in. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, how do you know that? And he's like, oh, I worked on the switches for the for the module, for like the module that the Apollo went in. And you know, it's it's sad that he's a he's a janitor now, but back then he was working like with the switches of the goddamn Apollo probe. Like, mm-hmm. that's amazing if you ask me. So, I, yeah, I just thought that was an interesting I think, anecdote. I think he's the argument going. that he's trying to make is that well, while like you know, like who cares? Like, like basically, if you're a guy who's waiting on the welfare lines, then why do you care about a man walking on the moon? Yeah, from that right? from that perspective, yes. Right. Yeah. I think that's. I, mm. and well, it's the, aspirational. And from the man dying in Vietnam for the corrupt data. More like Eddie said, it's kind of absurd that that we or they lived in times where they put a man on the moon, but at the same time you had people that would standing in this welfare lines. That it's like, it doesn't make sense to him. Well, it's a broken think- system who would produce such a result that would put its um, efforts into bringing people to the moon while at the same time the people in the country are lining up and are hungry. I, can, I completely disagree with that assertion because the fact that we have welfare, welfare and a social safety net is uh, mm-hmm. it speaks of how advanced mm-hmm. we actually are. That we don't let people go hungry. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah, say. It's, it's uh, almost yeah, like speaking, exactly. yeah, speaking, speaking as a Mexican, you know, at least you had money going towards science and exploration, where, whereas here there's no welfare and the politicians eat lobster every day and stuff like that. <laughs> so there's people on the streets practically starving, and then there's the exactly. high and mighty. Yeah, so I would sort of, um, I, I agree that it's not optimal to yeah. spend a lot of money on wars and uh, space travel when you have poverty, but it could yeah. be way worse. Yeah, I think it's it, it goes back to the original re- problem we had when we mentioned the middle class and that he's just finding the faults in what in reality is a solid system and may not need a the resolution may not need a radical approach for a solution yeah not i think it's i think it's he's trying to focus more on the people actually living in the society compared to like some like because to him the man on the moon could be completely obligatory because again his focus is on the people themselves which is why he very much focuses on the aspect of democracy a lot. So more focus on the individual aco- the individual reality than the national achievement. Um yeah, yeah, I would say that's true. I think there's a lot to say about that statement, like a man on the moon versus a, a guy on a bread line, but like you got to see the net effects, right? Like how many people were employed by the space race or the space program? Yeah, but then um, to counteract that point with it, in his defense, um, how many people died in Vietnam? And how many of those veterans ended up living impoverished li- lives that uh, saw them, that brought that them even more... That kind of seems like pain. apples and oranges. Maybe that's a false yeah, equivalent. Thanks. Maybe you could say, okay, the okay. Vietnam killings wasn't that good, but putting a man on the moon is not the same thing. Exactly. It was, maybe that was a good thing. You know what I mean? And when you put it in, in one, put it there in one sentence or whatever, 
Sorry, my English just sucks. But you know what I mean? If you put the, these two things together, the Vietnam killings and act as it's the same yeah, as putting it, someone it on the moon, it just doesn't make sense. Exactly. It's, uh, it's you not can a false reframe it. It's an inappropriate parallelism. Like, he's trying yes. to draw a parallel between the two things that, in my opinion, mm. shouldn't be drawn. And in, in actual reality, the fact, uh, the fact that he's uh, pointing out that we have a welfare system it's a point toward our current system, not a point against is, it. Is so. it? Sure, but in, in his eyes, means if people need welfare, that means that they are not as good off as others, so there's no equality. And, yeah, the country I, doesn't care about equality as much as killing people in Vietnam or putting someone on the moon. Okay, think, that's fair. Yeah. Well, I, I think he's simply saying it just to prove a point, because the point is, is that He's saying, what is it? The next sentence after that, these are the days when man has his hands on the sublime while he is up to his hips in the muck of madness. So mm. he's saying that there are some sublime parts of society, but at the same time, he's he is stuck in madness, whether it be in welfare lines or being killed in Vietnam. Mm. And he sees this as a major a major flaw in the system. I think we, we do understand... We do understand his argument. Mm. We just disagree with yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's an excellent yep. point. Yes. Anything else? Um. No. I think we can continue. Okay. Today's generation faces all this and says, "I don't want to spend my life the way my family and their friends have. I want to do something to create, to be me, to do my own thing, to live." The older generation doesn't understand, and worse, doesn't want to. I don't want to be just a piece of data to be fed into a computer or statistic in a public opinion poll, just a voter carrying a, a credit card. To the young, the world seems insane and falling apart. On the other side is the older generation, whose members are no less confused. If they are not as vocal or conscious, it may be because they can escape to a past when the world was simpler. They can still cling to the old values in the simple hope that everything will work out somehow, some way, that the younger generation will straighten out with the passing of time, Unable to come to grips with the world as it is, they retreat in any confrontation with the younger generation with that infuriating cliché, when you get older, you'll understand. One wonders at their reaction if some younger youngster were to reply, when you get young, younger, which will never be, then you'll understand. So of course you'll never understand. Those of the older generation who claim a desire to understand say, when I talk to my kids or their friends, I'll say to them, look, I believe what you have to tell me is important, and I respect it. You call me a square and say that I'm not with it, or I don't know where it's at, or I don't know where the scene is, and all of the rest of the words you use. Well, I'm going to agree with you. So suppose you tell me, what do you want? What do you mean when you say, I want to do my own thing? What the hell is your thing? You say you want a better world? Like what? And don't tell me a world of peace and love and all the rest of that stuff because people are people, as you will find out when you get older. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say anything about when you get older. I really do respect what you have to say. Now why don't you answer me? Do you know what you want? Do you know what you're talking about? Why can't we get together? And that is what we call the generation gap. Uh, it seems pretty loaded. Oh, boomer memes. They existed back in the 70s, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. This is basically the... Uh, time for change, you know? This is basically the... Uh, it's not a face, mom and dad. Part of the exactly. book. Exactly. Parents just don't understand. <laughs> right. And I, although... This isn't I can't anything mean. new. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say that I can't appreciate the... The idea of, okay, don't dismiss uh, a young guy telling you he or she wants to change the world. Like, don't dismiss them, hear them out, uh, sort of question them respectfully and uh, find out what they want and how they plan to do it. I think that's a sound advice. But yeah. It's a nihilistic approach and... I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll get an answer for it later, but it just seems very, yeah, nihilistic and pessimistic about it. And How so? 
there's only one argument to be had when it comes to the generational gap. Mm. There's not much that the elders can relate to for the younger generation. But then again, then again, he did. He that I think that he's trying to bring it back to, or he's going to bring it back to, um, the earlier mention of the older generation not bestowing upon the youth the knowledge of radicalism and how to get things done. There, there is a cognitive distortion that happens within probably every individual which is called discounting positives and it really seems like he's discounting like, uh, a lot of positives yeah, yeah. going on here like the older generation does have a lot of sh their their shit together okay well hmm. don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. right well, I, I i think what it is is that it's not just that well the, he's saying that the older folks do have their stuff together but in doing so, they suddenly become disconnected okay. with society, or they feel like they don't have to participate because they, he, what is it, um, unable to come to grips with the world as it is, they retreat in any confrontation with the younger generation with the cliche, when you get older, you'll understand. Not actually explaining the wisdom behind that cliche, but to just use it as like, oh, well, that's just an answer and I don't need to explain it kind of thing. And later on, he, what I would say, tries to provide like a basically a steel man of what an yeah, older I, person I did would catch say. A steel man, given, but it's also a little bit unrealistic. I mean, it, it's idealistic. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you guys are talking about uh, steel men, I know what straw manning is, but what's steel manning? So a straw man is basically when you make an argument more simple than it actually is, and therefore easily um uh debunked so to speak a steel man is doing the opposite where you take an argument and you try to give the best possible reason for that argument um in trying to uh just dismantle like to that out. argument all right i, I think that's an like... excellent question by right. the way yes yeah psychomate what were you saying oh no i just kind of wanted to know what that meant because uh i, I heard of straw manning a lot but steel manning's new to me um, such an ad I've used it a lot, oh, yeah. or a few times. Yeah, it's it's kind of a more, it is definitely yes. a more recent term that oh, has come about. I think it's absolutely fantastic that it exists. Yes. Agreed. So one thing about this paragraph is the cliche, when you get older you understand, is not the entirety of the conversation. Typically, at, at the end of explaining something, and the person doesn't understand, they don't get it, and then it's kind of like, if you don't understand what I just explained, I, I guess you'll have to get older before you understand, which is something that every young person, regardless of the age, has experienced, because there's always someone younger than you mm -hmm. that doesn't understand life as well as you. So having it just be a simple, um, oh, uh, yeah, it's just put brushing me off, it, it's not real, and, it, and it's it's, it is a straw man of the actual argument because there is the wisdom there that can be passed down from generations and up to the older generation. Because of the different perspective, this is kind of why the diversity uh, of age and um, even race kind of brings together and, and opens up different perspectives to try to find something that is the best possible. So uh, I just don't like how they... How, or how he wrote it like that. Um, and then the end, how he kind of makes it, if they did desire an understanding, they would say all this, and it's really kind of bowing down, and I really don't... I, I wouldn't appreciate no. being talked all to right. like that. Yeah. On top so, of that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't appreciate being talked to like that. So I, I would probably... I, I would have probably the same reaction as say, you'll never get older again if someone would try to... <laughs> Try to talk to me like, oh, well, how do you feel? Oh, what do you mean when you want to say you do your own thing? It's really kind of a um, condescending tone. Yeah, and it yeah. paints the picture as if there were no sensible old people around. Like there are no people who made sense or who could really talk to young people. And I don't know if that is true. So, and okay. maybe at that time all the old people there 
where I like like this, but yeah, yeah I, I doubt it a bit. And I think what you said was true that considering there are adults that make sense that can explain what they mean and can pass on their values. Yeah, I'll, his I'll point is a total straw man. Anecdote here. Yeah, an anecdote, but he he acts as if this is how it is. You know. Yeah, I no, was I think going Alex to, to tell give you an anecdote. anecdote. Yeah. Was given some of the my best life lessons from my grandmother. I think it's that it's a cliche that gets used to try okay. to avoid okay. an issue. At the beginning of the paragraph, he says, if they are not as vocal or conscious, it may be because they can escape to a past when the world was simpler. So it's basically saying that, you know, the older generation are just simply trying to avoid the issues I and don't... not deal with the actual problem. And what he's saying that is that the younger generation is that therefore having to deal the with this The approach is ridiculous, though. When you get younger, that's impossible. But when you get older, that is a possibility. Uh, are, are you yes. talking about the retort from the younger person? When you yeah, get that's younger, that's a snarky thing to say. Are you kidding? Right. Yeah. No. It's just... it, it it is meant to be a bad reply, yeah. but he puts in there on purpose because again, he's trying to paint the picture of the stereotypical radical, so to speak. So yeah, he puts it in there not as a good reaction, but as a bad reaction from a young person. Yeah, I think Saul is trying to say, okay, you as a as an older person don't sort of don't dismiss the young people, but l like Alex says, okay, you as a young person don't also dismiss the the old people because there's also you know th there's science behind uh, when you get older you'll understand because uh, the the chemicals in your body sort of um, stabilize right after twenty something 24 25 it's not so just... yeah so being young is sort of like being in an altered state of and, mind and it's, <laughs> in a way yeah. It's necessary yeah, yeah. As well. teenagers are the worst humans i mean i don't i don't think he's trying to take a scientific approach to it i think it's more just of a like th no. the whole phrase when you get older you'll understand is more of a philosophical uh cliche i guess if anything i know i know i'm just saying we understand his point but also, there's also there's another side to this coin that i i i try to explain with the little bit of science that i know <laughs> um i also wanted to mention that um the thing is uh, when you get older as an argument is also valid because especially when we're talking about politi political issues and stuff like that, there are just so many high concept problems and ideas that require the attention and need to be that they feel need to be tackled. But as even at people in like their twenties or eighteen or even late twenties they don't fully understand what the matter is and they look yeah, at the thing and be you like, I can't explain that to them. this way. Why can't you just explain that to them? I think this reply, oh, when you get older, you will understand. But some uh, I, I, oh, I remember that it pissed me off when I, I yeah. heard it in school. Yeah. And it's, it's... I, I had one teacher who was a really great teacher, physics teacher, and he was the kind of guy who would take the time to explain things. And he even, his brother had a bar, and we would go there and just chill with him because he was cool, and we could talk with him about anything. And, you know, these are the kind of teachers and old guys you remember, mm -hmm. and they yeah. inspire you. And the other teachers who would just say, ah, oh, you don't understand, you're a kid, or when yeah. you're kids older. Yeah, I don't have yes. good impressions of them, and I don't understand, I, I understand it now, because they had so many kids, they have to take care, and they just wanted to do their job, and they were stressed, and they wanted to go home, they weren't really excited about the topic they, was, they were teaching. So I, I understand that now, that I'm older, but I think, yeah, as a general rule, this statement oh when you get older you understand it's just lazy yeah. and yeah you can you can explain shit i mean you can see even jordan peterson explain yeah old religious text and myths and stuff things that people never before i think uh, maybe not never before but 
you know, m many people didn't understand these myths and they were just teached as, yeah, just take it and just accept yeah, it. That, that is exactly. And if you can even explain these things, yeah, you can even explain political things that are maybe that young people don't understand at that moment or don't have the information right now. So it gets replaced with some answer that is insufficient. Yes. Yeah, that's true. And it's a good thing about this day and age, I suppose, that there's more access to information. And so, uh, like uh, like EC said, um, there's access to people like Jordan explaining um, these things and taking the time to explain these I, things. I can also yeah. add a little bit I, to the uh, the contrary here. There definitely was a failing within the last couple of generations. One of the best things that parents can do for their children is express their own failings, their own experiences, where they did wrong. I certainly wish that my parents did that for me. It would be better if parents did that, if they did relate. Mm -hmm. And but I think the real issue there, and it is something that he's explained, is already mentioned, which is that it's just complacency okay. upon the older generation. They're they've kind of had their mark. They are they feel complacent with how society is now. That uh, they don't feel that the need to uh, justify it to these kids because they don't understand. They were there or whatever. What else does that say though? Doesn't that say that society is in such a good place that parents don't need to, to do that? What I would, Apparently what I would, not because of yeah, Vietnam and welfare lines. What, what I would say is that just because society is a good place now doesn't mean it always not. will be. Of course, of course. Right. But that's why you need to, mm -hmm. to pass on the torch. And that's so one of the things that Olensky is bringing up. Like, there's a failure of passing on the torch. Yes. Oh, um, he says, like... Uh, let me let me look for the right part that I'm trying to say. They uh, they see the world like um, unable to come to grips with the world as it is. I mean, yeah, they kind of do. I mean, not ev you can't be oblivious to everything if you're trying to live in life. People probably hear about all these kinds of things at their job, and even the older generation, one way or another, hears about what's going on. I don't think one can be entirely like uh, oblivious to what's going on. So it's really unfair to say they're trying to hide from it when mm. they're stuck living in it. You know, it's not two worlds, it's just Ooh. one world with different perspectives. Yeah, that's great. I thought right now that, you know, the old people are maybe unable to come to grips with the world as it is and they can't see it right as it is in its entirety. But they can see one part. They can see, for example, how the society that now exists is built on maybe what w values it is built and the younger generation sees another part they maybe don't see the the values and what on what it's built and the past but they see maybe what is wrong with it right now the two movies well, saying Adams, one, take a shot. nobody sees the whole picture i heard david huh? say two movies. <laughs> the, the two movies thing right scott adams win the bigly two movies. But you know what I mean, because he criticizes, at least in this part, only the, the older mm. people. They don't see, see how society is, the whole picture. But I think that is also mm. true about the younger people. Mm. They right. just see in, in another picture, they see just another half yeah, of the picture. Yeah, and to get the thing, the old people say, oh, when you get older, you understand. Um, and I think that's that's what they where they want to go what they want to what they think the young people will understand or oh, they will understand how the world works because what they mean is they will understand how society works how we got to where we are now but uh, the younger uh, people only look to a place where they want to go within the society. so they are not conserving <laughs> they're not conservative hmm. you know what i mean okay. I yeah. think it's unfair to say that, um, oh, the older generation doesn't see the whole picture, as if the younger generation sees the whole see. picture. Yeah. I mean, they're they're probably, like, uh, I'm assuming young is, like, from 20 to 30, like, in right. this case. Yes. So, like, when you're from 20 to 30, 
yeah, you probably haven't even seen much until you get into, like, the late 20s. Then you've probably seen some things. But, you know, the young, young generation, pro like, hasn't really seen anything. So it's unfair to say they had they don't see everything. Like, yeah, they see more than, like, the younger generation, at least. But so, they have seen. All this, I think, applies to today's standards when uh, in the 70s, maybe it was easier for the older generation to be oblivious. And maybe the young people were on the, you know, on the right side of, of history, per well, se. I mean, I, I kind of don't that, see it. That has changed. I mean, that, that has changed, so I'm just making that hmm. clear to the viewer, I think. Mm. Well, I, I, I personally don't see how one can be more oblivious in the 70s. Like, maybe it's because there was less television or internet, you know, less, like, news going around. Yeah, definitely but less. Newspapers. Things were more local back then, I guess. I, I assume that the federal government had a little more of a hand in maybe shifting the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, back then, not wow. so much yeah. right now. So I imagine that's the case because that that was the case up until very recently here in Mexico. It seems like the federal mm -hmm. government ah. certainly is trying. To well, at least they banned TikTok. Yep. Yeah. Let's Do we want to move on? on? <laughs> that was that was a win. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. We can. Yeah, let's move on. What the present generation wants is what all generations have always wanted: a meaning a sense of what the world and life are, a chance to strive for some sort of order. If the young were now writing our Declaration of Independence, they would begin when in the course of inhuman events, and their bill of particulars would range from Vietnam to our black uh, Chicano and Puerto Rican ghettos, to the migrant workers, to Appalachia, to the hate, ignorance, disease, and starvation in the world, such a bill of particulars would emphasize the absurdity of human affairs and forlornness and emptiness, the fearful loneliness that comes from not knowing if there is any meaning to our lives. When they talk of values, they're asking for a reason. They are searching for an answer, mm -hmm. at least for a time, to man's greatest question. Why am I here? Something seems huh. twisted in there. Yeah, yeah. How so? The whole, like, Declaration of Independence part really, like, makes me think about, so like, people who are so into social justice. Also, and why, this... why does it make you think about people who are into social justice? Can you explain that? I mean, oh yeah, uh, our bill of particulars going with all these people, like, with uh, special identities. And yeah, it says to, to the hate, ignorance, and disease, and starvation. But to start it with, like, people with nationalities and races, it's it just seems very, like, it seems weird to start with. Okay, I see that. It's probably just like I'm thinking it of, but like I'm overthinking. Also, this part about um, the whole world kind of stinks of, um, well, <laughs> I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. Oh, I'm awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. I, I'm still trying to figure out what I feel that, okay, guys, that I is need twisted to go. about it. Like, he, he's talking about all the worst things that have happened over the course of human history, right? So, this is kind of like the. Uh, the Marxist thing of is that it's it's the beast within humanity that moves uh, throughout history, kind of thing. And so he's he's basically trying he's basically looking at all these bad things that happen in the world, and he's trying to say that it's it's so absurd that to these people they fail to find some sense of uh, meaning in their lives. Except that how you find meaning in life is it's a very complicated process. Yeah. Okay, Jose, now draw an eagle eating a snake right in the okay, middle. Okay, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> and the eagle has to be standing on tunas. Oh, my lord. On what? On cacti. It's very specific. Uh, on a cacti. Isn't there like a native story behind that or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's basically um, some, yes. you know, a bunch of uh, Mexica tri uh yeah, like people were sort of looking for the the promised land and and the god said oh you, you you'll know when you'll find it because you'll see a, a, an eagle eating a snake while standing on a cactus <laughs> there it is beautiful i was confused oh, oh. for a second because i was looking at something else i so i was yeah, like what's being distracted by something <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alex, I, I think... what's your name is L? 
All hands on deck, damn it. What you mean by something's wrong, Alex? I think I can like identify what what might be wrong here. I think this like whole part about the uh, if the young were writing our Declaration of Independence, um, they chance for strive for some order. I think it's just putting mm. radicals on a high horse. Yeah, nailed it. Yep, I think you did. Sorry, say that again. I just think that the whole writing our Declaration of Independence, uh, striving for some order, it's it seems like yeah, you're putting like... radicals on a high horse. Yeah, like I think who wants to say that the, order. the old I people think... aren't. I... Also striving for order. I, well, uh, no, that's that's not the right way to say it. Exactly. Well, he's Read saying order. that the younger people do not have a sense of meaning in their lives because they can't organize the world because okay. it's so complex. So I think in in his what he's trying to say is that the younger people, that well, it just says a chance to strive for some sort of order. So later on, he he uses the Declaration of Independence specifically because he's saying that. Um, they are writing this Declaration of Independence because they are trying to get away from all these bad things that have happened in the past and or are trying to do something about said things. Because that's what the original Declaration of Independence was, is they declared independence from the tyranny of Britain, which I think is why he uses the Declaration of Independence specifically. I, I can't put my finger on it, but something just seems twisted. Yeah, I think it's... I don't know. I think it, it's him definitely focusing on the the worst things about civilization. Not saying that they well, not saying that they shouldn't be addressed because he's saying that these things need to be addressed. But he's saying that society or people are so nihilistic that nothing gets done about it, and so people lose meaning in life. Hmm. At least that's thinking, that's what I think uh, he's trying to say. Now that I'm thinking about it. If the young were writing our Declaration of Independence, our independence from Britain, like, what would, uh, like, I think he's just saying, like, if we would have, because I don't think the Declaration of Independence has anything to do with, uh, uh, black Chicano, Puerto Rican ghettos, uh, ignorance, disease, and starvation in the world. That has nothing to do with, like, independence from Good Britain, point. so. Good well, point. It, uh, he, he uses... When in the course of inhuman events, independence yeah, but... from inhuman events. That's what he's, and again, he's using this as like an analogy, so to speak. Uh, well, I guess I, I, I kind of don't, I, I don't see it. Hmm. Maybe I just disagree with him. Hmm. Could be. I mean, it's it's basically a negative outlook on life. He's saying yeah. if Young were writing our Declaration of Independence, they would. He's saying that they would focus on all the inhuman things in the world and the bad stuff that happened. So he's saying that the Young are kind of expressing this negativism that he earlier explains. Is negativism the same as pessimism? Uh, yes and no. Um, pessimism is a little bit more of a refined philosophy. Um, negative. I, I don't know. I, I would say no. Uh, yeah. Wait, before you continue, I just want to say... It was yeah, fun yeah. talking to you. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, oh yeah. Thanks for being yeah. here. I have to go because it's oh. approaching approaching 5 a.m. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Good night, guys. Good night, good night guys. Bye. Good night. Yep, have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, let's go. Are we still waiting or should I read? Oh my gosh, I, gotta... I think we're waiting. I just gotcha. looked, up, looked up Yippee because I didn't know what a Yippee was. You mean a yuppie? No, a yippie. Yip, yip, yip. Right here. Yippie. And a yippie is a hippie that is politically active. Oh. Um, that's short for the Youth International Party. What the hell? Okay. That is weird. Never heard of that. Yeah. It's kind of a pothead thing from the okay, 60s. From the late 60s, or early 70s. Um... It was started as a youth-oriented, radical, and countercultural revolutionary offshoot of the free speech and anti-war movements. Okay. Huh. Interesting. The um, more you know. I, I thought it was kind of strange that he used yippie here after saying that being a yippie is copping out or dropping out of the system. Mm. Because uh, that's kind of what he's talking about. I know we haven't read the paragraph yet, but... 
I, I would definitely hold that thought until we uh, actually go over it. The young react to their chaotic world in different ways. Some panic and run, rationalizing that the system is going to collapse anyway of its own rot and corruption. And so they're copping out, going hippie or yippie, taking drugs, trying communes, anything to escape. Others went for pointless, sure loser confrontations so that they could fortify their ration rationalization and say, well, we tried and did our part, and then they copped out too. Others sick with guilt and not knowing where to turn or what to do went berserk. These were the weathermen and their like. They took the grand cop out, suicide. To these, I have nothing to say or give but pity, and in some cases, contempt, for such as those who leave their dead comrades and take off for Algeria or other points. What I have to say in this book is not the arrogance of unsolicited advice. It is the experience and counsel that so many young people have questioned me about through all night sessions on hundreds of campuses in America. It is for these young radicals who are committed to the fight, committed to life. I like how he calls communes a cop out. That's actually interesting, isn't it? I mean, I guess it is because when you're isolating right. yourself from the problem, quote unquote. Well, in a commune, you're you're not participating in this the overall society. You're participating in something else that's isolated from society. You're making exactly. your own society instead of improving your existing one. Right. It's therefore making it a form of escapism. I thought it was interesting that he included the yippies in the dropouts. Um, they are kind of half and half. They believe in a system of uh, let's see, they believe in a system of rejecting all isms, uh, including socialism and anarchism. Um, they choose a motto that is, do your own thing. So it's not about being completely disconnected from the system, it's about rejecting the previous systems and isms and all of that type of stuff, in, including... Uh, some of the stuff like, like communes uh, because they are based in cities instead of being kind of out in the, in the woods and disconnecting from everything. So it's, uh, it's interesting that he's, he shows that as a, a cop-out to the system. Um, I guess it could be, but at the same time, isn't being a revolutionary kind of a cop-out to the system as well? But he, I would say it's a cop-out in the sense that it doesn't work within the system. It's just kind of trying to do its own thing. And it's almost like, it almost sounds like a revolution without a cause, basically. I mean, that that's the way that I interpreted that definition of a yippee. I, I, find, it, I find it interesting because they don't have something really that, you know, I guess you could say it is without a cause because it's against everything. Um, but uh, it's more of a, it's really individual, and uh, ha having something that individualist really, you know, maybe that's detrimental, but I don't know. I, I feel like that's, you know, once you create a party, because Yippie is short for members of the Youth, youth International mm. Party, um, I, I feel like that is a, a type of left-wing activism that still exists today. I think I need to... It's amazing. We've we've already gone over this once, and I still need to think about that last collection of paragraphs. The 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 last one. What I have to say, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the last couple that were just read. It's um, I think I get a little right, bit yeah. thrown off because of the uh, the whole suicide part. I don't know uh, if that's exactly valid to say people are committing suicide because of political disagreements like really i guess because they're not contributing the, to the society there. don't you remember that girl in oh. in 2016 she was like oh my gosh i can't believe this is happening i'm going to kill myself you know i mean that's i know that was like 2016 and this was 71 oh was so, that was that when trump got elected and <laughs> yeah famous okay i think i know which one you're talking about yeah um, but i know it's not an example that's relevant like to the book but, uh, you know, people who, like, who, you can even threaten it, you know. It's a case, I guess, like, for today, but I don't know what happened in 71. Mm. I think it's that 
the young see the world as so chaotic that they feel like they can't do anything, and because of that, they therefore commit That's suicide. What he's actually <laughs> talking about is the Weathermen. Um, the Weathermen is a name for the Weather Underground, and they're a democratic, uh, famous for being a, a, a domestic terrorist organization that conducted bombings in the 70s. Mm. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, huh. Oh, so, I did not hear that. Yes, so so the Weather Underground were actual radical terrorists, left-wing terrorists. And um, so that is obviously um, what he's saying is going too far. You know, th that cop-out to the political system is, is obviously um, a, a step too far and immediately got uh, garnered pushback and, and did not work, help the cause whatsoever. Um there are some people say that say it changed the world because um, it did get noticed. It was a, a big thing back then, but at the same time, I, I don't think it garnered the uh, the support for the cause that they wished it did. And he, okay, so Absolutely. that gives it more context. It's not suicide by depression. It's suicide by uh, activism, yeah, that... so to speak, or zealotry. Uh, Wouldn't that be martyrism? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Man, I'm I'm just using weather underground to get weather yeah. reports. Uh, yes, <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. Okay. I use weather underground. I've got an app on my phone. Bruh, oh, it's a terrorist man. app. We're, we're going yeah, all. You're on a watch list here. now. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but he's uh, yeah. So he's saying he's uh, basically critiquing uh, how they're taking the easy uh, way out suicide, but in his way, he also sees it as a poor sense of activism so to speak, because he says, and in some cases, contempt. Yeah, because mm, you don't like the the cases of someone killing themselves and sort of kick-starting uh, a whole movement is, uh, I think it's in the single digits, right? Because how many Shaolin monks have yeah, sort of lit themselves on fire Immolation, to, sorry. Yeah, to protest China. Yeah, and, and China doesn't yeah. give a fuck, so... And I think, I mean, I think that's a debate within uh, that community, too, of, or in Buddhism specifically, of whether it is a noble thing to self-immolate or not. Free Tibet, yo. I'm sure it's contentious there, yeah. Uh, that, that I'm sure uh, what Garth says, uh, it is uh, a very contentious topic within the the religion, I, I, I assume. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I guess I just don't know how much uh, martyrdom uh, is uh, an ideal that uh, Buddhists hold to because the whole uh, oh, it's I mean, tricky. I don't, I don't know. It, it, right. it's big fat. I don't so, know in Buddhism. Well, I don't know well, Buddhism. Well, Alinsky <laughs> is not really talking about uh, martyrdom. He's talking about people who are like, oh, this world is so cruel. I'm gonna kill myself. Right, like yeah, the yeah, Kurt yeah. Cobain like, types. Uh, existential despair. Exactly. Not the ones who are like committing mm. self-immolation and protest. Like oh, that's yeah, completely absolutely. different. In my opinion. I believe oh, okay. it's completely different. Yeah, well, that's that's even worse, right? Because you're not even trying to change the world before you you, you sort of just assume that it, that there's no hope it, in the it bank. It seems to be conflating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, coming from a position myself, uh, having an anxiety disorder, depression, suicidal tendencies, suicidal thoughts. Yeah, you can you can pawn it off on something systematic. You can do that. But it's not really where the problem lies. I, I just, it, it just seems really, really dishonest to say somebody is going to kill themselves because the political system is so corrupt. Like, are you kidding me? Read the Gulag Archipelago. Come on. Well, I, I think Saul would almost agree with you on that, is that suicide is not sure. the answer, so to speak. Because, yeah. again, later on, he says he has some sense for contempt for it because it's, in a sense, you're abandoning uh, mm -hmm. the other people in your movement. All right, yeah. Can I read this next paragraph? Oh. Remember, we are talking about revolution, not revelation. You can miss the target by shooting too high as well as too low. First, there are no rules for revolution any more than there are rules for love or rules for happiness. But there are rules for radicals. Yeah. who want to change their world 
There are certain central concepts of action in human politics that operate regardless of the scene or the time. To know these is basic to a pragmatic attack on the system. These rules make the difference between being a realistic radical and being a rhetorical one who uses the tired old words and slogans, calls the police pig or white fascist racist or motherfucker, and has so stereotyped himself that others react by saying, oh, he's one of those, and then promptly turn off. Well, demonetize, Damn. first of all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, or does that only apply to, like, the first uh, minute or so? Yeah, I, I, I can't remember how either. Also, works. I never want to get monetized. There's no reason we'd be demonetized for that, because it's insulting cops and stuff. That's not bad. Oh, right, right, oh, right. 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 <laughs> Although we did say the word fascist, so that might uh, that might do it. Man. I kind of just wanted to read that paragraph, because i got to say Susan, motherfucker. We are exposing... <laughs> uh, All right. We are... We are giving the world this book you're welcome yep i might be i might be missing misunderstanding him but i i wouldn't uh, take importance from revelation before revolution because the revelation might be that you you don't need <laughs> revolution <laughs> right right maybe hmm. what was i well he kind of ex uh, expands that idea a little further later on in the book so mm -hmm. But yeah, so he's talking about revolution. Well, he's talking about revelation. Is revelation is a concept that where something like I don't, I don't want to because revelation has a very the deep meaning to it. I don't want to say it's an epiphany because in a sense an epiphany is kind of something a little different. But he's saying that with regards to you know maybe I'll just wait until we get to that portion of the prologue. So, okay, yeah, that, that's why I said that. An idea, and I, but I was getting ahead of myself. Yeah, that's why I said that I might be misunderstanding him, so we'll wait, I guess. There's right. definitely foreshadowing going on here. Right, exactly. Well, it is the prologue, so... Although, my most egregious disagreement with, uh, with everything in the prologue is that he states that uh, there are no rules for revolution any more than there are rules for love or <laughs> rules for happiness. That is the most egregious thing, I think, because there are plenty of rules for love. I mean, oh, happy, yeah. you can, yep. ha yeah. Ha yeah. you like you could debate happiness, sure, sure, because that can be very subjective. However, for love, it's like if you're a dad who has a child, there are certain things that you have to do if you want yes. to love your child, so to speak. And this, and especially in Christianity, like Christianity, there is very specific way of mm -hmm. how to love another person. So yes. We're defining rules as sort of a um, guide of, uh, what would you call it? A map. Uh, behavior, right? Right, right. And so there is a guide to behave uh, in order to achieve love or in order to properly love or in order right. to achieve happiness or, or to sort of um, uh, keep that happiness, right? Because, for example exercising is a good way to to remain happy or to be happy and to remain happy mm -hmm. so that's that's a rule right yes yeah uh, maybe i mean i i personally am not a person that exercises but i keep fit so yeah that, that's what i mean and uh oh, with sure. love for example consent is a very yeah. important rule right <laughs> We can yeah, all agree. You've got, yeah. Yes, I you've hope got everyone agrees. Stigmas against going against consent. Hashtag me too. You know something about something about I as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, it has to be. It has to be. Well, in a way, it almost has to be. Depending on the love, it, it has to be mutual to a certain degree. But it's like if you want, like I mean, Jordan Peterson time. If you love someone, you'd want to try to unleash the potential that is within that person so that way they can become the person that they've always wanted to be type thing. Yeah, it is It is mutual, you know. I don't see my girlfriend... We, we have an understanding. I don't see my girlfriend as a piece of meat and she doesn't see me mm -hmm. as an ATM. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hashtag national right. girlfriend day. I, I think that's going to be clipped right that, That's a little intro. joke. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Say no to objectification <laughs> of anyone. 
Uh, this paragraph has has a perfect example of something that I say oh, often. It, Jose. Uh, everything that is said Jose. before the word "but" is always bullshit. That is a so, really well done swastika. But <laughs> <laughs> I think, like the first thing I kind of want to get out is, uh, are there kind of, like I I might like be weird for asking this, but are there really rules to happiness? Do you guys think so? Uh, yes. Um, I think, well, so here, so here's the way that I think about happiness, right? It's, I don't know, if, if you, if you search for happiness, you're not going to find it. But with regards to happiness is that, I don't know, I, I always think that happiness is always something that just will happen naturally is you can't force yourself to be happy. But it's, is that like a rule? I would say that, yes, there is one rule for happiness, and it is uh, what keeps us, or gives us uh, the laws, is that your happiness, much like your freedom, cannot be attained by infringing upon someone else's happiness. Uh, I don't uh, know. That's a good rule. If, that's a good rule, yeah. If that were true, it's, I mean, totalitarian that's a very governments very wouldn't exist. That's I, what I mean with liberty and stuff. But with ha like, if we're if we're talking about happiness, like for a particular individual, like what uh, if someone asks what it means to be happy, I mean, it really depends on what you're like. It really depends on the human will itself. It's like, what do you like? It it all depends on what you want. And sometimes people will want things that are completely unattainable, or it's out of their own power, and so they go their entire lives striving for something that they'll never get, and then it turns out that they're not happy anymore. So my critique of that would be it depends. I mean, happiness depends on what you want. Right. It has a lot. It's like it's a, what do you call it? It's a directly proportional or inverse, inversely proportional to expectation. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it, it's highly subjective. It's like there's no, there really isn't, I, I would argue, there isn't an objective happiness. So, well, I mean, okay, there. I guess it depends on what you mean by happiness, but but for the time being, there, happiness there is a there there isn't a just objective law? route to happiness, but there is a subjective feeling of happiness. Yes, yes. Um, and and my definition of happiness would be creating your own happiness, because no one else can grant you happiness. You have to be able to figure out what makes you happy, how to reach the goals of what is the peak of that happiness. And to get there, that is the process of happiness. You can't have someone else come into your life and be like, okay, this is what it takes for you to be happy, so do this. Because 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, that's their definition of happiness. And it's not going to make any how, fulfillment to you. Uh, so, so how about on. the opposite? There are definitely things that you can do that you should avoid that will make you unhappy. Less happy, unhappy, unfulfilled. I think that's actually more universal mm -hmm. than happiness itself. Yeah, because if you want to go uh, scientific about it, um, endorphins is what sort of create the feeling of happiness in the brain, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. and there are certain things in our bodies that create uh, endorphins, like well, like uh, purpose, exercise, exercise. Yeah, well, you know, love, all that. Right. The only reason I kind of brought that up, the whole rules for happiness thing, is because I kind of, like, from, this is just me, I kind of define happiness as in uh, success in moving forward, and I would define, like, being unhappy or depressed as being, like, like losing progress or just, like, being in a stalemate, constant pause in progress. So right. when I was like, oh, there's rules for that, and I guess maybe after listening to you guys, there could be one rule to, like, my definition, which would be, like, you shouldn't make progress by mm -hmm. being an asshole to other people. I guess that's more of a moral thing, so, yeah, it really is subjective. If, I mean, if, you're, if your standard for happiness is progression is okay, so then what is the thing you're progressing yeah. towards? Because that is going to be Absolutely. just as important. And I, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't subscribe to the philosophy that we should exist for pleasure. 
type thing, which mm-hmm. can also fall under the category of happiness. But um, right. hedonism. Yeah, exactly. Although happiness and pleasure are uh, uh, different in my book. So. Well, happiness is really satisfaction at the end of the day, isn't it? Mm. Um. Yeah. Um, there's, a strong, yeah. there's a strong correlation between being happy and being satisfied. There's like a positive fulfillment of being okay and being happy, and, and then there's just uh, sort of um, having the ultimate pleasure uh, every time that, that that sort of feeling gets uh, triggered by substances or sex, and I think that's what Garth... Uh, you're trying to um that's the sort of thing that that we should avoid right the the morbid pleasure uh because it it becomes addictive right but the the whole being fulfilled and and moving forward towards a a positive purpose that that's that's better uh for you and for society so like i yeah because if i was to ask like if we were to ask jordan peterson how do you attain happiness? It would be uh, it would be fulfilling your potential, so to speak, right? So that would be his standard of happiness. In my own mind, happiness is such a subjective thing, but it's it, I don't know. It really, I mean, it can be a goal, I guess, but it depends on what you think happiness is and how you and how you get to there. So, anyway, yeah. One more thing is. Uh, protesters today would take quite a bit of lessons from the last sentence here. The rules make a big difference between being a realistic, radical, and being a rhetorical one that uses tired old words and slogans. Um, We see these tired old words and slogans um, really, really repeated, like, uh, just forever and ever and ever. And, uh, he says someone that hears these old old slogans is just going to turn it off and that's kind of what's happening so i think ha- having a consistent message is good but using the the old words and and the old tactics here are are kind of dated so um e- even by the 1970s that these words were dated and it's still happening in 2020 it, it it really it, it makes me wonder if it came back around again or what happened to make it to where calling racist wasn't just acceptable but was kind of a, a cultural thing to do mm. in protests mm. you know i honestly don't know um That's... yeah i don't know well i mean Name calling your opponent has never been something yeah. that was out of fashion. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I, I agree with that. The, the question is the slogans, the actual tired old words and slogans that, that he uses. Um, the calling the police a pig. I mean, if we've watched any of the riots at all, I'm, I'm sure you've heard that. Um, white. That's what. That's an insult. Fascist. That's an insult. Racist. That's an insult. Um, of course, motherfucker. That's an insult. You, you hear that yelled at the cops all the time, and um, it does stereotype people because the the ones who use those words. I mean, when you hear that lobby, that's someone. You can automatically assume what the person is that is throwing the insults. It's it makes it kind of, it makes it easy for people to put you in a box mm-hmm. and turn you off, and and yep. that's kind of what's happening. And that's uh, something I agree with Saul here completely. And um, I think it, there could be something taught to the youth today from this book if it was actually fully uh, employed. It's oh it's, yeah, absolutely. Although it's that, certainly better oh, than white fragility. Absolutely, hands down. <laughs> That's sure. Oh I think gosh. we can all agree on that. <laughs> yep. Uh, Haven't read that one your yet. Your mind but, might yeah. melt if you read it. <laughs> it it's honestly yeah, it's, pretty it's, racist. Well, I, I, I'll, 
I'll I'll read it if someone gives it to me for free. And it's all like, um, well, what is it? Uh, sorry, uh, the words. Uh, I mean, yeah, th those those two, but also, uh, uh, the um, when it's your own perspective and you're bringing out. Bringing your own experiences as evidence of the whole thing. Anecdotal, anecdotal Excellent. evidence. Oh, right, right. Okay, yeah. It's all anecdotal evidence I, I've heard. Oh shit! Oh, right. <laughs> My bad. Okay, there we go. What? Yeah, I, I well, love so the drawings doing, by the way. In you're the highlight, doing it excellent, it's, man. Uh, I I Dude, I. All right, you're elected. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This failure of many of our younger activists to understand the art of communication has been disastrous. Even the most elementary grasp of the fundamental idea that one communicates within the experience of his audience and gives full respect to the other's values would have ruled out attacks on the American flag. The responsible organizer would have known that it is the establishment that has betrayed the flag while the flag itself remains the glorious symbol of America's hopes and aspirations. And he would have conveyed this message to his audience. On another level of communication, mm -hmm. humor is essential. For through humor, much is accepted that would have been rejected if presented seriously. This is a sad and lonely generation. It lasts too little, and this too is tragic. For the real radical... Doing his thing is to do the social thing, for and with people. In a world where everything is so interrelated that one feels helpless to know where or how to grab hold and act, defeat sets in. For years, there have been people who found society too overwhelming and have withdrawn, concentrated on doing their own thing. Generally, we have put them into mental hospitals and diagnosed them as schizophrenics. If the real radical finds that having long hair sets up psychological barriers to communication and organization, he cuts his hair. If I were organizing in an Orthodox Jewish community, I would not walk in there eating a ham sandwich, unless I wanted to be rejected so I could have an excuse to cop out. My thing, if I want to organize, is solid communication with the people in the community. Lacking communication, I am in reality... Uh... Uh, re reality silent. Sorry about that. Throughout history, silence has been regarded as assent. In this case, assent to the system. I think I think you can read the next well, paragraph. I, I, it has I definitely want to make a point about humor is uh, essential. I believe the last time that we read this, uh, that we yeah. definitely focused on that. It's a shame the left is killing humor. That's the left can meme. That's a really excellent point that humor is essential. Look, it it's human. It it it's working. It's working it within is, uh, reality, no. in a sense. Go ahead, Amazon. Um, I was going to say that on the subject of humor, I think it goes back to the overarching sort of message that we've seen of nihilism in the revolution and how he sort of how much disdain he has towards that. Because if we think about it, the whole getting rid of jokes and the entire message here about trying to understand the positives, mm -hmm. which kind of goes against some of the stuff that he's talked about because of how negative some of that is. But he acknowledges how the lack of hu humor and um, the burning of the the burning of the flag is all a way of that is a way that leads to that nihilistic cop out that he so much he like, hates like so suicide. Much. Mm. Exactly. I think yep. for me, I really like 
like disagree with using humor as communication. Like, yeah, humor is a form. Well, well it, humor can be used with communication, but using humor to like push a point isn't Samantha that B. just woke comedy? And like nobody likes woke comedy. Right. I, I think there's a there's a question about that on the on the political compass test, and it goes something like, "Ah, oh, do you think it's uh, the the fusion of comedy and and humor is uh, good or not?" Don't you mean com? Don't you mean I comedy and don't. politics? I think this uh, mindset. Of my bad. My bad. My bad. My bad. Not comedy and humor. Duh. Uh, I mean comedy and yeah. I mean entertainment and news. Glenn Beck. Mm. Yep. I think. Uh, Mixing humor and news makes it mm -hmm. more palatable to the 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 wider audiences. The problem then becomes the the bent or the bias. And exactly. yeah, like 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 you've all said, um, the woke comedy. I think the problem is that um, that's the only sort of um, uh, comedy mixed in with politics that is permitted, right? So if, let's say, you could watch um, humorous news, but from both, uh, like, sides of, of, the, mm -hmm. of the aisle, yeah. th I think I that'd think... be okay. And so yeah. I think that what Saul is saying is, like, okay, don't, don't lose uh, your your sense of humor because you you might lose your yeah. your own mind. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And uh, I, the um, the the thing about go, comedy. Go sorry, Alex. Absolutely. Um, the, the the thing about the comedy is it has to be funny. You're, you're hitting the same um, point that I was. <laughs> <doing>. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to be funny. And if you take yourself too seriously, uh, then you get the left can't meme. I mean, this is just what happens. You, you sure. have to take yourself with that that side of, of humor. And, and if you're too serious about it, then you won't be able to push a, a, a something that seems flexible. You're only going to see, you're only going to be able to push something that seems really rigid and and it's exactly. very unhumorous and it's intimidating uh especially politically because when you have a counter narrative and yours has the the slight of humor to it and a little bit of flexibility uh, that's going to be the more appealing direction because you want to have that in case something changes it will be able to be changed but if you are uh, it, what, what is it? Ideology, uh, ideology binds and blinds. Jonathan Haidt, take a um, shot. Morality. And this is yeah. Mo morality. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. Morality binds and blinds. So when you have a overly more moral uh, goals, it's going to blind you to your sense of humor, and yeah, and that's going to be something that people will pick up on. So I agree with him. Is you you don't want to alienate people and push them out of uh, the community that you're trying to build. Because right. what's the point? Right, and uh, to put an example to this, you know, back in 2016, I, I was in I was in the in the liberal bubble, <laughs> basically. Oh, and no, I no. Used, understandably. And I used way. to watch uh, late night. I, I used to watch late night with Seth, with Seth Meyers, and I liked the segment that he had called the uh, jokes Seth can't tell and it was you know he read the the setup and then a black either a black woman or a, a lesbian Puerto Rican woman would uh, say the punchline and it was and they were jokes aimed at, at lesbians or black people and, and it was really funny because it was sort of taking shots at their own side you know uh, they weren't taking themselves too seriously but then that segment got twisted and became a way to to shit about about uh, yeah to talk shit about white people and Republicans and all that and I was like oh, what am I doing? I think I think it's gonna go to and I bring I'm bring, I'm bringing that up again but uh, 
it's maybe not nihilism uh, it's not the word but mm. it's cynicism once you bring that cynicism into it and they that's when you lose the humor the actual humor in a joke because that that at that point you're not you're not making jokes yeah anymore. it's, you're it's just, just pot like shots. taking pot shots well i mean humor can be cynical and funny yep Although, yeah, yeah. So there is still, but it's like degree, John Oliver isn't the... Dave Chappelle. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's not. Well, in this, I, I mean, so he sets in the in the paragraph before, you don't have to scroll up, he's talking about the realistic radical versus a rhetorical one. And in these two paragraphs, he very much is describing this rhetorical radical. So he's saying, if you live in a community where you have to cut your hair in order to uh, participate in that community, community, then you have to do it for the sake of your cause. But at the same time, it doesn't keep you honest as an individual. Because if, like, long hair is just... If you honestly think that long hair is an acceptable thing, then, you, then I don't know. It's... Uh, just with, rhetor with rhetoric, it's... I mean, rhetoric specifically is... It's the art of convincing someone not just with reason, okay. but by appealing to one's okay. own feelings at the same time. Which uh, people have okay. argued with, like, is... What? <laughs> well, why do you think I'm going to draw? It's a barber spiral. But it's also a peen. Oh! <laughs> no, what are you talking no. about? Of course. No, it's a fireman. Of course you'd go there. It's not a fireman, it's a, a barber sling. So it goes like in a spiral. Yeah, whatever. To, to sorry, to, to finish my point is that I do agree with him that one has to work within one's own community because mm -hmm. that is how you participate in society, so to speak. Uh, especially when it comes to activism. But as far as how far you can go with that rhetorically without being dishonest is something that needs to be brought into question when it comes to uh, activism. So, there has to be a balance between being persuasive and not becoming completely dishonest, mm -hmm. like manipulative, it, right? Is that yeah, what yeah, Saul's really exactly. pushing, though? That's... Well, I don't know. I, I don't know I, if he's pushing it, but I, I think the, the... Sorry, I think the advice is sound, and I would urge, you know, uh, Mexican people <laughs> to take that advice, especially the feminists, because okay. uh, they they go out right here, they go out and they break shit, and they're not being persuasive to their cause. And so, uh, y you do have to find mm -hmm. that, that balance. Well, that in, it, in Saul's case, that would be like the realistic radical, right? That's just running around, screaming, breaking stuff, and it's like, they're they're technically honest, but they're they're not like able to do anything because right. they're just seen as this like I guess wild animal, so to speak. I would say that. I mean, in the sentence, if uh, if the real radical finds that having long hair sets up psychological barriers to communication and organization, he cuts his hair. So he's saying that people will. I mean, and I guess this is technically true that people will have to make sacrifices for their mm -hmm. cause. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only question is how honest slash dishonest uh, d does it have to go? And Excellent maybe that's point. a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, because the extreme of that would be maybe, you know, if you subscribe to the theory of Kathleen Kennedy, you know, uh, the producer of uh, Lucasfilm, that sort of, well, uh, was uh, a very important figure in, in the filmmaking industry and and now she's pushing this feminist agenda and you could say that it was dishonest this whole time because well I mean I don't know if you you'd have to be inside mm -hmm, her head mm -hmm. to know her motivations but but it was it is dishonest to take uh, a popular franchise and sort of mm. shove your ideology in there um and so I, I think that's the the extreme of uh sort of um infiltrating 
uh, structure in order to impose your your change per se. What I'm finding really interesting is uh, I don't know uh, um, just how much I I can agree with Saul on a lot of these points. And oh yeah, absolutely. I I've also got this. Like, uh, again, again, I'm going to admit that I have a bias going in. Like, I I kind of expect him to manipulate things. Like, to take truths and then just kind of warp them. Just ever so slightly. Uh, but I, I can't disagree with a lot of the stuff. I can't. Well... He's, I mean, I mean, this is, I mean, I always look at the cover of the book and it says a pragmatic primer for realistic radicals. So it's like, he's not so much worried about truth, I guess. He's just like, mm -hmm. does this work? Right. And he's saying, hey guys, okay. this is what works. You know? And I think when, when it's something that works, it, it needs to be grounded in truth, at least on some level. You can't just go out, like, punching Nazis, right? Accusing people of being Nazis just because they're, they don't agree with you. You can't do that. It's, it's not right. pragmatic at all. Yeah, and Saul would yeah, agree with you on that. I actually. kind of wish that Antifa was a little bit more, like, I wish that they read this book. Uh, right. Humor. They'd burn humor. it. Humor. Use humor. <laughs> <laughs> I think what's actually kind of important is not just using or like emitting humor. I think it's, it's what I, I don't think like this might be mentioned in like another chapter, but I think it's important to like understand how to receive humor, like to like against and for yes. you. Like, uh, I'll give an example. There's this guy on Twitter. He, uh, I think he, he draws, like, political com comics, I think. Like, pumpkin face or something. And he does this comic of uh, George Floyd. And this was around the time the whole cake meme was going around. Like and it, he just shows, like, it's just a comic. It's two slides. It's a drawing of Floyd. And then it's another, like, image of Floyd. But he's cut open with a cake. And then oh these God. radical, these radical like people, I don't know, come out of nowhere, and like bomb him and say like, oh, he's being super racist, but it's just George Floyd being cut open with like as a cake. Hmm. He's just a cake. That's that's the joke. Why did they have to receive that as like against their ideology? Well, like, yeah, sure, pumpkin face might politically like have disagreements with them, but well, that's not what the comic it's was about. definitely provocative. Was well, hey. yeah. Yeah. But I don't know why that reaction was so... Like, I, I can understand a reaction like, hey, man, this is a touchy topic. It's, it's George Floyd, of all people, but it, it didn't have to, like, explode. The dude had to, like, lock his account so then you wouldn't get, like, notification spammed. It, it was I kind of upsetting for me, at least. I think it's, I mean, it's for the sake of whatever cause they're fighting for, right? Yeah. It's, they, 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 they see themselves as, like, fighters, basically. Mm. Like, they are yeah. fighting for the, the cause of justice, so to speak. I kind of wish that uh, the author would mention, like, oh, it's important to receive humor, like, don't go out and make yourself look bad and it can affect your cause, or, or you know, something like that. But That's maybe that comes point. up later. It does, I think. Should we uh, continue? Yes. Uh, I, I, I had to. I was going to comment on on uh, that comment really quickly. Uh, that it points out a bit of the hypocrisy in it because um, people want to uh, have the the ability to have the humor uh, in their in group, but anything that's taken as an out group message to be attacked. And if you're trying to build a community, you're not going to want to be doing that, these types of uh, attacks and mm -hmm. othering of your community. 
Um, so there's a, 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 a there's a conflict there of being able to talk freely and talk down on others, but uh, I, I don't know how to say it, but it's it's really really kind of a, a tricky situation that they've put themselves in where they want to be the moral authority that says this is okay to do and this is not okay to do. Mm. Hmm. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if they're the authority, then that means that their enemies are the counterculture. And they can't be, like, fighting the power if they are the power. Well, imagine my yeah. shock. Well, it, it... Well, it's... I don't know. In, in the situation, it's like, where they... <laughs> if they're, like, threatening him, saying, oh, you can't say this, it's like, they're trying to my... They're trying to be a moral authority with sacrificing another, which is free speech. Mm. So, it's... Yeah. Morality is complicated. And, and not just morality, but... Only there, there's also a separation between morality and ethics. Uh, yes and no. Um, I always interpret ethics as a, a system of morals, and your grounding for that system of morality, that's just me personally. Uh, whereas morality is, in a sense, uh, um, very uh, nuanced, so to speak. Okay. So that so makes you're sense. saying it's complicated? I can agree that it's complicated. Um, I'm saying that... I I would say that the definitions are a little different, although, like, ethics and morality are very, very closely tied together. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and, and it's probably a wee bit too much for just a prologue. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Uh, did we want to... Anything else? I'm or... sorry. All right. Onward. As an organizer... I start from where the world is, as it is, not as I would like it to be. That we accept the world as it is does not in any sense weaken our desire to change it into what we believe it should be. It is necessary to begin where the world is if we are going to change it to what we think it should be. That means working in the system. There's another reason for working inside the system. Dostoevsky said that taking a new step is what people fear most. Any revolutionary change must be preceded by a passive, affirmative, non-challenging attitude toward change among the mass of our people. They must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that they are willing to let go of the past and chance the future. This acceptance is the reformation essential to any revolution. To bring on this reformation requires that the organizer work inside the system among not only the middle class, but the 40% of American families, more than 70 million people, whose incomes range from $5,000 to $10,000 a year. They cannot be dismissed by labeling them blue collar or hard hat. They will not continue to be relatively passive and slightly challenged. If we fail to communicate with them, we don't encourage them to form alliances with us. They will move to the right. Maybe they will anyway, but let's not let it happen mm. by default. Do we have any means to correct the uh, the wages there? Yes, there is an inflation calculator. Nice. I'll look it up. Wait, right. so is he implying that being on the le like being on the right is bad? Um, I mean, yes. there. That's yeah. Here's the thing about this that I take from the. Oh, uh, what I was going to say. Here's the way that I take about this book. Anyone who is politically right could use sure. this book to their advantage, right? Like, this could almost apply to anyone. But I think to him specifically, he definitely is uh, falls on the liberal end of the spectrum. Uh, probably, I would almost say, uh, liberal libertarian. Do you want me to tell you how much $10,000 a year is Do in it. 2020? Yes, how much? go for it. It's 63K. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's about how much, like, a blue dollar or a blue jaller <laughs> a blue collar job would a uh, would pay nowadays a so blue jaller yeah. cob it is <laughs> a blue jolly yes. rancher i could go for a blue jaller cob <laughs> like i said it is sound advice yeah it is sound advice to persuade the 
sort of the the non-political entities towards your movement if if you want to enact change uh, whatever that change might be depends on on you right what that change is also depends upon you so having a um, ha having a passive attitude to any change is kind of you must wait until people are docile before pushing something um, challenging to them. And right now, in in the current political climate, I'm not sure if we're in a passive no. uh, political climate. So, so pushing a revolutionary action right now is kind of um, adding fuel to the fire of division instead of um, bringing about a revolutionary change that they might see or... or perspective or individual goals at least on a national level um in in local uh local politics things can be moved around quite a bit but uh i, I think the goal of the revolutionaries is a national policy change well maybe maybe it's deliberate that they're doing it to sow more division that's possible i I think it's really interesting. So earlier in the prologue, he says that values and factors are, rel are, are fluid and change over time. But at the beginning of this, he says, I start from where the world is. So he acknowledges that you have to accept the world as it is first in order to want the change that you desire. But then he goes on to say that values and other factors then become fluid. So where I, I wonder where the line is... For, for that for Saul, right? Because if the world is as it is, it, 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 so to speak, then how fluid are actual uh, values and changes that he early earlier states in the in the prologue? At the given time, I, I guess you need to uh, start from where you are instead of starting from halfway to your ideals and, and going from there. Because, I mean, it's... That that's another thing that um, current politics is kind of missing out on is is they're trying to be a divisive person instead of seeing the world for what it actually is, and, and not just in a um, hyperbolic sense, but in an actual, real, truthful way. Um, because if you don't start with truth, you, you're 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 not <laughs> you're not being honest with people. And, uh, and people will see that. So I totally agree with, with what he's saying here. And the more he goes on, I'm, I'm starting to feel like he's not a, a communist or um, anyone that's really far left yeah. at all. I, I, don't, I personally don't think he is because he highly criticizes the far left and orthodox yeah, I'm, communists. I'm really picking yeah. up on exactly. that as well. You did it first. But uh, I guess we need to see in the rest of the book. That that is very true. Okay, onward. Should we um, move on? Yeah. All right. Uh, Our youth are impatient with the preliminaries that are essential to purposeful action. Effective organization is thwarted by the desire for instant and dramatic change, or as I have phrased it elsewhere, the demand for revelation rather than revolution. It's the kind of thing we see in playwriting. The first act introduces the characters and the plot. In the second act. The plot and characters are developed as the play strives to hold the audience's attention. In the final act, good and evil have their dramatic confrontation and resolution. The present generation wants to go right into the third act, skipping the first two, in which case there is no play, nothing but confrontation hmm. for confrontation's sake, a flare-up and back to darkness. To build a powerful organization takes time. It is tedious, but that's the way the game is played. If you want to play and not just yell, kill the umpire. What is the alternative to working inside the system? A mess of rhetorical garbage about burn the system down. Yippee yells of do it or do your thing. What else? Bombs, sniping, silence when police are killed and screams of murdering fascist pigs when others are killed. Attacking and baiting the police, public suicide. Power comes out of the barrel of a gun is an absurd rallying cry when the other side has all the guns. Lenin was a pragmatist. When he returned to what was then Petrograd from exile, he said that the Bolsheviks stood for getting power through the ballot 
but would reconsider after they got the guns. Militant mouthings, spouting quotes from Mao, Castro, and Che Guevara, which are as germane to our highly technological, computerized, cybernetic, nuclear-powered mass media society as a stagecoach on a jet runway at Kennedy wow. Airport. Hey, what does germane mean? Germane. Um, uh, it's out of date, mm-hmm. I would assume. Oh, uh, okay. So it's so he's saying that if one was to spout quotes from Mao Castro and Che Guevara, he's saying that it would not like it basically doesn't fit the context of our current society, and it would it would accomplish absolutely nothing. Oh, okay. Hmm. I think it's funny that he's saying that 1971 was like a cybernetic, computerized, like mass media society. I mean, I mean, uh, it kind of was. Sorry, I just looked up the word germane. It means relative to something. So ah. he say, so he's saying that uh, all these quotes are not relative to our society at all, basically, because we've advanced as a society. It's hard to disagree with that statement. I mean, yeah, don't go with Mao or Che Guevara. I feel like Alex is going through the uh, the article. I don't know, maybe it was the Onion or like the Babylon Bee, but it was shocking. The person you hate the most just made a good point. I think that's what he's going through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there are there are plenty of worse people out there than uh, Saul Linsky. Oh yeah. For Saul. example. Mao, Castro, no, Che Guevara. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's right. Don't do that. That reminds me of that George Carlin joke. Ah, if you're getting bullied, like, don't like try to fight against the bully. Like, redirect it. You think Comps look stupid? Look at that guy over there. <laughs> uh, I have to go because I have food downstairs. Right, I mean, could you fine. just like you know start and stay here? <laughs> 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 I could, but uh, I also have to call some other people to come downstairs. So, all right, man. Oh, no, that, thank I, you I, I so understand. much for joining. All right, I'll be back. It's been great Later. having you. Thank you for your input. No problem. Bye, Bye Amazon. Thank Provecho. you for having me. So, that's right. I like, this, I like this paragraph a lot. Um, Applying it to right now, uh, what do we hear? Uh, burn down the system, yes. Yelling, do it or do your thing, I'm similar, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, bombs, yes. Sniping, uh, not really, but I mean, I, I'll sleeping shots. far off. Um, Silence from police, police uh, are what? shot and killed. Uh, yeah, yeah, that can say that happens. Uh, when others are killed, um, I mean, how many people are we up to right now? 30-something? Um, attacking and baiting the police. I mean, this has been the tactic in Portland for months now. Um, public suicide have not seen, thank God. Um, power comes from the barrel of a gun. It, well, yeah, and um, they are carrying guns, and the opposition also has guns. So you're kind of um, Can... kind of at a draw with that one. So, yeah. so uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Again. It's repeating this same old tired right. stuff. I just I just want to ask that uh, add that bombing, it, like somebody did throw an explosive the other day at a federal building in Portland, and yes. uh, yeah, that baiting thing is totally happening. This thing about attacking and baiting police, totally happening. Since that is such a losing battle, could that be considered a public suicide of of sorts? Uh, um, I, you know, I mean, I think. I mean, what I think what Saul would say in this book is that it doesn't help your side; it just helps the other side, right? Because yeah, that stereotyping. I, I that. Oh, oh, sure. No, I, I mean, yeah. I, I agree with him. Like this, this is not uh, is not helping. <laughs> You're not helping your case by being so so damn violent and and stupid and like you you do have to be pragmatic about I, it i almost want to airdrop these books I... on portland this book but but <laughs> can i say something to the to the effect uh... of uh power comes at the barrel of a gun that's why the second sure. amendment exists of course that's exactly. all i have to say yep i actually really like the uh the third act analogy that he posts because it perfectly describes what's happening it's like People mm-hmm, want change mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. now. They don't want it later. They want it right now without going through the entire process. I think 
I don't know. I think that's really actually really sound advice is that no, you have to you have to know what you're mm-hmm. doing. You have to progress up to that point. It takes time. Yeah. Because anything any change that is demanded immediately, well then you just you're just gonna yeah. look like a terrorist. Unity twenty twenty. Yeah. What I think he's talking about here for um you know, working within the system is uh, compromise, and compromise has become mm-hmm. a dirty word in politics. Um, neither yes. side wants neither side wants to have anything to do with uh, compromising with the other side because both sides are viewed as evil or um, you know a- attacking the way of life and, and what they want. So um, compromise is what our system is built on, and working outside of that system is working outside of compromise and i I think that's going to be one of the biggest issues that anybody really runs up against when they work to uh change what we have um it's kind of difficult because uh i I do think there's a lot of flexibility Mm -hmm. inherent in the system but if it's pushed too hard and and too fast you're just going to lose out and, and you might as well just fold Right, and you'll then you'll just be seen as the the realistic radical that's just the uh, you know demanding everything and shouting and whatnot. Jose, yeah. what on earth are you doing? <laughs> Ow! It looks this like they don't know him. Ow! Uh, I don't know if you have enough time to draw Jake Rivera because I I mean, yeah, uh, do we want to move go. on or did we want to keep talking? All right, all right, then we're gonna have to power through oh this. Oh my god, then. Jose! All right. <laughs> Let us in the name of let us in the name of radical pragmatism not forget that our system with all its repressions we can still speak out and denounce the administration attack its policies work to build an opposition political base uh true there is government harassment but there still is that relative freedom to fight i can attack my government try to organize to change it that's more than i can do in moscow pecking or Havana. Remember the reaction of the Red Guard to the Cultural Revolution and the fate of the Chinese college students? Just a few of the violent episodes of bombings or courtroom shootout that we have experienced here would have resulted in a sweeping purge and mass executions in Russia, China, or Cuba. Yes. Let's keep some perspective. We will start with the system because there is no other place to start from except political lunacy. It is most important for those of us who want revolutionary change to understand that revolution must be preceded by reformation. To assume that a political revolution can survive without supporting base of a popular reformation is to ask for the impossible in politics. Uh, All right. So this is what, from, if I can draw like a parallel, this is where the, the, I don't even know what to call them. The SJWs? I don't even know. This is where they blew their load early, right? So they I, were, I, doing, good. They were doing good by like making all the movies about like feminism and whatnot, and now they're going like full tilt, mm-hmm. abolish the police and stuff like that. And the white man is evil, you know. I, I just call them leftists. Like that's that's really just the term that I go for. Right, but I don't want to like uh, put everybody in a you know in a little box like the whole well, the left side of the when... spectrum in a box. Oh, go ahead. I've been thinking about this a lot. Like, how do you call a spade a spade in this instance? Exactly. Yeah, because every name we have for them, it's actually kind of uh, works yes! in their favor. Yes. I, it either, it either right. works in their favor. It either works on their in their favor, or it's like so vague that people are like, "What are you talking about?" Like, I know a liberal. He's not like it's, that. You know. That's why I say regressive because I I do feel I, I am looking at the, what they're causing, and you know giving gi- giving them that uh, tag because they are regressing um, political dynamics. You know. Right, right. I actually agree with you. I think I'm convinced that regressive. Yeah, I, like I definitely think put on them. regressive leftist. I actually, somebody used the word deconstructionist, ah, and I think that's a good it. word, but it's okay, so... Okay, yeah, it that does work better than my idea. But um, to, to get back to the book, I actually... Uh, I think something that helps a lot is that he talks mm. about reformation, right? So it's like, you have to... 
in a way, you do have to change people's minds before you, before you act upon something, right? Yeah. It... Um, especially if it's not through like mere coercion, right? Where it's like you're not really convinced, but you're you're threatened so much that you just have to go along with it. That's it... kind of what's happening now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Say BLM yeah, that, or that's you're a, a problem. It, it, yeah. That's a big problem. Yeah, neo racist. Yeah. Yeah. Although I, I I mentioned this earlier that he he says that like he he I don't know I just find it really interesting that he talks about um, wanting to find a meaning in life, yep. um, but then I guess his solution is a political one, and I'm very skeptical Fuck with yeah, um, being able to find meaning with something that's political. Because I, I don't know. Because I think there's just so much else to, I guess, life in general than things that are uh, merely uh, uh, political in essence. Although I, uh, I don't know. It, it really depends. I think that's an that's a great observation, and I wanted to bring up something about that along the same <clears throat> excuse me along the same vein, but I, I didn't have the right way to articulate it <laughs> no no i'm 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 just agreeing with with gartham on that like um that really stood out to me i am back do you guys like the reference to conquest of bread here <laughs> no i didn't catch it oh i thought it's it was like, a reference the conquest to bread of bread <laughs> You know what we should do? We should, uh, I should save this PDF as it is, <laughs> and we could upload it somewhere. That would be, yeah. Just absolutely transcript. context to anything. Well, I mean, there's a little oh, bit of context because of the book. Okay. I love your little, your <laughs> Adam there the three, well. three. Wait, what is that? Adam is greater than horse is that Santa? and carriage. Yeah. Horse with it's nuclear a, power. Uh, it says, uh... Yeah, it says that nuclear-powered mass media society is better oh. than a stagecoach, so... Although that's like a wagon rather than a stagecoach, but that's close enough. Uh, <laughs> I've watched <laughs> too much like, Bonanza, like, what do you want? You better fix it before David gets done walking his dogs! Those who, for whatever combination of reasons, encourage the opposite of Reformation, become the unwitting allies of the far political right. Parts of the far left have gone so far in the political circle that they are now all but indistinguishable from the extreme right. It reminds me of the days when Hitler, new on the scene, was excused for his actions by humanitarians on the grounds of a paternal rejection and childhood trauma. Uh. When there are people who espouse the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy, or the Tate murders, or the Marin County Courthouse kidnapping and killings, or the, Wash or the University of Wisconsin bombing and killing as revolutionary acts, then we are dealing with people who are merely hiding psychosis behind a political mask. The masses of people recoil with horror and say, our way is bad and we are willing to let it change, but certainly not for this murderous madness. No matter how bad things are now, they are better than that. So they begin to turn back. They regress into acceptance of a coming massive repression in the name of law and order. In the midst of the gassing and violence by the Chicago police and National Guard during the 1968 Democratic Convention, many students asked me, do you still believe we should try to work inside our system? Hmm. I think that last paragraph sort of bleeds into the like coming paragraphs. Yeah, yeah so we should keep, I, that up. Uh, keep going. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. These were students who had been with Eugene McCarthy in New Hampshire and followed him across the country. Some had been with Robert Kennedy when he was killed in Los Angeles. Many of the tears that were shed in Chicago were not from gas. Mr. Alinsky, we fought in primary after primary, and the people voted no on Vietnam. Look at that convention. They're not paying any attention to the vote. Look at your police and the army. You still want us to work in the system? It hurt me to see the American army with drawn bayonets advancing on American boys and girls. But the answer I gave the young radicals seemed to me the only realistic one. Do one of three things. One, go find a wailing wall and feel sorry for yourselves. Two, go psycho and start bombing. But this will only swing people to the right. Three, 
learn a lesson, go home, organize, build power, and at the next convention, you be the delegates. Right. Okay, so this is exactly mm-hmm. what's going on right now. Isn't in it? a way. Yep. This is like twice in the same reading when he says, oh, uh, going to the right as if it's a bad thing. That is, this doesn't Excellent. seem very centrist to me. And I know you guys are saying like, oh, this is this guy has some left-leaning bias. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but, you know, there are right radicals too. And I guess, you know, there's bleeding bias. Actually, one line I really like, if you would scroll up just a tiny bit, is the uh, bombing and killing as... uh, He says, then we are dealing with people who are merely hiding psychosis behind a political mask. That is a line that is extremely Mm. prevalent. Because you can make the argument where it's like, yeah, these are like highly political people, but it's like, there's probably something else that's going on inside Mm. their own mind. I mean, it takes something inside a person. I mean, it, it's the psychoanalysis of most murderers and serial killers. But it's like, what drives a man to take another life and stuff like that? Or do or act out in these ways? And it's an underlying issue. And, a lot, and the... And for a lot of people, the best way to express themselves and the only way to do that politically is through radicalists. My no radicalism, is cognitive distortions. Hmm. There, there's okay. something that is that too. a distorted view of reality, and that's what causes somebody to harm another individual or kill them. And also, it's. Damn it. we lost I, I'd the say the. Oh no, but um, I would say also um, this goes into the mass media because well, if you're told and in the same way that these they believe of the system is faulty and there's no and a lot with a lot of. Uh, Rat, new young ra- young radicals, as they would put it, um, not knowing how to really express that or how to solve that. There's only so many things well, they can do, and the option that they give, that he gives, which is to exercise your democratic right and use the tools that you are given in this democracy and for a public. Oh, hey, hey, Gabe. <laughs> Um, to to bring the the solution that you want to see. Um, that's not very sexy. That's that's the thing that that's the solution that no one, everyone understands that everyone on a level agrees with, but no one necessarily likes. Yeah, that's the. It's the one that requires time and effort, basically. <laughs> and it's and also the fact that it's very indirect. You know, you can do it, and then it's like, oh, then it failed. Now I don't. Now I don't think that it works anymore. Right. Right. And just one of those systems. Anybody got anything else? No, one of the one. Of the problems with um, the left is the constant normalization for uh, what could be considered psychosis. I'm sure what uh, Saul would consider psychosis. Um, so the further that gets um, normalized, you become a a party that is your advocate. Mm. So there are people that feel completely connected to their advocate. And are willing to engage in violence for it because without them, it's, they might as well be dead. So um, there is a, a bit of this going on, and I, I don't think it can be denied. But um, uh, it's—I uh, I wish it would get called out, 
but I just don't see it happening. Yeah, I wish that would be called mm. out as well. I wish that a lot of things would be called out, but it, it almost seems, uh, in, in a way, um, a social, unethical thing to do, which is ridiculous. Because we have something closer to uh, an objective morality that dictates our ethics, and yet the ethics that are being used by the media seem a little bit more plastic. I I don't know. I, I always say that morality is uh, uh, inherent, like, I, I, to use the philosophical term, the ontology of morality is subjective, but that doesn't mean that you can't share a morality with someone else. Yeah, you can't. It's not like you can't pass down your morals. Right, like you can, like you can try to teach someone your morals, but inherently it is subjective because morals depend upon a uh, uh, a subject to enact those morals. Mm -hmm. So the whole objective morality thing, I'm very, very skeptical about well, personally. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's another I mean, debate. fucking rape and murder and pillaging well... have been a thing for generations long before we're kind of diverging from all right. the book yeah I, okay yeah okay. All, right. All, right. all right i just want to say one thing all right hot is hot right that is an objective truth we all can agree on that even though that is a subjective reality are you talking about in the sense that hot equals Feeling. hot logically speaking the existential response to heat we feel it as hot. Uh... We also feel um, moral uh, injustice. Mm. I, I, can see that, yeah. I, I don't know. I think that's really different because when when you say we feel like, I mean, you could, I mean, the the problem that I always find with feelings is that. Anyone can feel anything about anything for whatever reason. So that's, I don't know. I, I have issue with feelings and emotions in that sense. As far as uh, what what do we do with our emotion, emotions? Um, after learning about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, in a sense, you could make the argument that it helps us develop, develop a certain, uh, uh, makes us uh, more conscious in a, in, a, in a way. But anyway, sorry. I just uh no, no, no. fair enough. In there. All right, let's go on. Unless you had something more to say. Okay. All right. Sorry. Nope. I'm. I'm. I'm oh, good. I, I wanted to say that I. I agree with um, Alex. Just in the sense of if we're talking about morality, then there is uh, measurable um, positive and negative morality. I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's we, not all around well-being, but anyway, yeah. We, we can uh, we yeah, can uh, have that time. discussion another time. I would love to have. Yes. That yeah. Sounds um, fun. Anyway, we will uh, con um, continue. Speaking uh, of another right, time, right. I do have to get going. Uh, uh, unfortunately, so sorry, I didn't talk around you know. long. Yeah. All right. It was Later. A really busy time. Oh, it was so so good to thank have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. I'll try and join for longer next time. Sorry. All right, man. Yeah. Um. Thanks for making time for, for this. Keep in touch. No worries. Be well. I'll catch you all later. Later. Will do. Bye. See ya. All right, Power let's through, do this. Baby. <clears throat> Remember, once you organize people around something as commonly agreed upon as pollution, then an organized people is on the move. From there, it's a short and natural step to political pollution, to Pentagon pollution. It is not enough just to elect your candidates. You must keep the pressure on. Radicals should keep in mind Franklin D. Roosevelt's response to a reform delegation. Okay, you've convinced me. Now go, now go on out and bring pressure on me. Action comes from keeping the heat on. No politician can sit on a hot issue if you make it hot enough. 
As for Vietnam, I would like to see our nation be the first in the history of man to publicly say, we were wrong. What we did was horrible. We got in and kept getting in deeper and deeper, and at every step we invented new reasons for staying. We have paid part of the price in 44,000 mm -hmm. dead Americans. There is nothing we can do ever, or sorry, there is nothing we can ever do to make it up to the people of Indochina or to our own people, but we will try. We believe that our world has some of age so that it is no longer a sign of weakness or defeat to abandon a childish pride and vanity, to admit we were wrong. Such an admission would shake up the foreign policy concepts of all nations and open the door to a new international order. This is our alternative to Vietnam. Anything else is the old makeshift patchwork. If this were to happen, Vietnam may have been somewhat worth it. Who? Keep reading, keep reading. I, I, it has to I do. Uh, the to next interject. one has, has its own concepts itself. Who, so we got to stop there, sorry. Who are the people okay, okay. that need to feel guilty about that? Like, why, why is it that the American citizens need to feel guilty about shit that fucking politicians chose to do? Without their consent. I, I think that's what... I, I think that's what he's saying, though. He's All saying right. that... The, uh, Fair enough. Or no. Well, he says... Okay, so the way that he phrases it, he says, I would like to see our nation. So what you could say would be correct. I first interpreted it as the government would apologize, but, it, but he puts it in the context of our nation. So what you're saying could be right. Yeah, I was thinking it was more of us. He was more talking about the system and saying that the system needs to acknowledge its own faults. Jose should have gone with purple. And what is it? <laughs> purple? God damn it. I'll go. I'll go. I kind of wanted to bring this up. Like, he says, such an admission will shake up the foreign policy concepts of all nations yeah. and open the door to a new international order. That's yeah. globalism. Oh, I was gonna say that's just outright fucking psychotic optimism. The, One world. I yeah, like exactly, that. exactly. All that all that will do is say, "Ah, oh, see, the United States was doing it wrong." Like it'll just pr pr provide more finger pointing. I, yeah, or 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 actually, what I think it would do is just get make it make make America weak and. Show it as a scapegoat for nations to be like, ah, oh, see, these are the bad guys. These are exactly. what they did was wrong. They even admitted it was wrong. So they're it's the bad man. Do you guys remember what happened the last time we had an international order? World War Two started. I I don't know if he means order in the sense where it's uh, another um, establishment, so to speak. I think it just means order in in the in the in the regular sense that it is order because he oh. talks about how it would shake up foreign policy concepts, not robbing, uh, like not like Illuminati style or anything, but just in the sense that international affairs would be it would have a new order to itself, right? So there's a certain way to do international policy. Okay, I guess I can see that. I could be wrong, but that's how I read it. Okay. not robbing any nation of its sovereignty, so to speak. Well, I hope not. I also wonder if when he, in the first paragraph, he says, from there it's a short natural step to political pollution to Pentagon pollution. Is he saying that satirically? Or does he mean that upon the specific issue of pollution that it would go uh, political and then it would get to the Pentagon, so to speak? That would address pollution. What he's talking, I think he's about, just talking about. Oh, sorry, you go ahead. It's okay. I think what he's talking about is the um, the step of the narrative. Uh, you start off with something really agreed upon, um, like mm -hmm. pollution being a bad thing. I think yes. we can all agree pollution's bad. And then from there, you have a, a next step. And, and the next step from the pollution is to say, look, it's the government that's making it so this pollution is here. So it's political pollution. And then you can go from there, and then once people start agreeing, hey, maybe it is the government's fault that we're not as green as we should be, they jump into 
Pentagon pollution because that's another natural step. It's a short jump because political pollution to government pollution is like it's really um, it's a really easy step to take. So you can start off with something very agreed upon and end up with something that's kind of polarizing, but still have a lot of the people that initially agreed with you on your team. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, uh, let me think about I, that. Yeah, I need to think I, yeah I, well. and with me, it's what kind of... The whole point here is he's talking about your delegates. He wants you to be the people. So you're, you are the people on the ground. You are the people that the politicians answer to. Um, and when you yeah, have I, that, that's, that's when you need to be pushing the more uh, the steps and the push forward. And, and it's really seeing what you can get away with with the organization that you have. And you're trying to see exactly how far you can push it without it end up working in the opposite direction and, and the pendulum swinging back on you. And um, I, I think that's one of his main concerns in this prologue is trying to say, uh, if you push too hard, the pendulum's going to swing back on top that's of you and wipe you fair. out. So, uh, that's really, be really careful. fair. Yeah, I think that was spot on, actually. Yeah, in the it says no politician can sit on a hot issue if you make it hot enough. Hmm. So the polarization is a tactic because they want to make these these issues hot and polarized. That's that's where the uh, they they derive the organization. That's where they derive the movement. And then from there, you take this next steps. So there's a, a really simple way to drive up your number in support here. And because it, it's really the, the whole thing talking about being um, said. Um, I uh, sorry. Do you, did you want to finish your thought? Yeah, he, he was talking about being the being the people, being being the person that, yeah, uh, screw it, chop this off, Alex. I'm not well, chopping I, it. No, well, I mean, I'm I think it's fine. <laughs> I, well, what I would say, I don't know if polarization is necessarily a part of it because Saul Alinsky in the prologue does not like radical polarization because he advocates to working within communities. So I, I don't think polarization is part of that. Uh, his I don't think that's part of what Saul Alinsky is talking about, so I would I would disagree with that. Well, m not polarization polarization on a uh, political level, on, on kind of like the group level, but more on an issue because you want an issue to be something that is uh, controversial. You want it because that's that's what they're talking about when they mean hot. They want it to be something that goes away. They want it to put out the fire. They want it to go away because it's a pain in their butt. So the more polarization you can get, the more pressure you can get to get a solution. And if you push, if you combine that with the organization, you can really push for some radical change with the, the support of the people. So I, th I think that's what he means by... Uh, by a hot issue because it's not really about making uh, factions and teams but it can be on say abortion so if you have that you're gonna have some type of pressure and there's gonna be some urgency placed on the uh, the solution and, and finding a, a good outcome that can make somebody happy at least to the point to where it's not a big issue anymore. I, I think that can certainly be the case, but I don't know. I, I don't see uh, uh, controversial... Well, I don't know. I mean, I would have to think about it, but I don't know if... 
I think you could possibly have a hot issue that is not necessarily controversial. I mean, it could be the case, and they I don't I definitely agree that they exist. Like there are controversial issues that exist. But at the same time, I think you could have like an issue that isn't exactly controversial that but that just doesn't have a lot of uh uh uh, the steam to move forward, so to speak. So I uh, I don't know if I agree because you push. I, I don't know how you the, have a lot of the controversy, and then uh, therefore the, you how can controversial something is is necessary exactly. to be able to. Get Which it I to think the is what Solid State gets approved on a political. build up your base, get it big, and then you can push the government. Well, so, some something will have to get approved on it, or, or some type of change will have to happen, and that's kind of the the progressive mantra is change, and. The more change, the better, uh, because the more changes means the more opportunities it's going to change in your direction. Um, so I, I think there's a way to uh, to have it assist you in, in a tactic, but um, I, I do understand that it can work backwards. So that's why it's, I would say you, you need to be, um, you need to have the agreed upon narrative first before you can really press a hot issue right like for example you're saying that it needs to have support already uh, at about. least uh, at least something i mean we can use the his example of pollution and um because people so. will agree and then yeah. the more you pressure the the government on pollution the more people will be on your side perhaps, perhaps but then word. you can switch it and then it starts to become um it, it starts to become something else so there's a, there's a way to kind of sneak in um I, I think it's commonly referred to as give an inch take a mile okay so like a more appropriate well pollution is actually the perfect example nobody wants to be more polluted and i would i would say that It's right, almost as if it actually is pragmatic. Excuse me. <laughs> and it would work. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, that, and it would work, because, like, you can see that even now, like, if there's any one thing that the recent riots have done, they have actually uh, influenced the government. And probably not in a way that they would have liked, or not in a yeah, way that is helpful. Definitely doesn't seem like a but pragmatic. But they are shaping it. Well, right. yeah, exactly. Because everybody's saying defund the police, and like a lot of places are actually going ahead. Oh yeah, with that, and it's think, ridiculous. Right? So, All right. There was definitely a primer, though. Like the whole, obviously, like the whole primer that started off was a man getting killed on video. So, I don't know, like. I, I would agree with uh with Garth here. Like it's talking about building a base and um, then pushing up an issue. Although if if Saul were to talk, he would say the problem with them is that they're not seeing the world for as it is, and right, that's the man. step that they're skipping. I, I see. Which is what he's I'm, doing. I'm having some like I, I'm having some difficulty agreeing with somebody that I disagree with. All right. Okay. You know what? Yeah. I better get used to it. Yep, because that's the only way we're going to fix yep, our right. situation right now. All right. It's the enlightened centrist way. All right, continuing. Unless someone else has anything Done. else to say. Nope, I'm good. See, now it's forever good. hold your peace. No, I, say, I say, yes, look look at this book as uh, sort of, it's, it's like a guide on how to build a weapon. It, it's telling you how to build it. It's not telling you who Whoa. to aim it at. Yeah. So they Except, said yeah, talking about, well, you know, if well, pushing people to the right. Exactly. Oh, well, I wanted to say something about that. It's, uh, you know, it's interesting how maybe the right back then uh, behaved like Ooh. the far left nowadays. They were completely purit puritanical and intolerant. That's a good point. So, That's a really oh yeah, how point. they say how 
there was this there was the threat of the authoritarian right that was during the seventies and eighties kind of. Yes. Yeah. Are we are we good? Yep. A final word on our system. The democratic ideal springs from the ideas of liberty, equality, majority rule through free elections, protection of the rights of minorities, and freedom to subscribe to multiple loyalties in matters of religion, economics, and politics rather than to a total loyalty to the state. The spirit of democracy is the idea of importance and worth in the individual and faith in the kind of world where the individual can achieve as much as his potential as possible. Great dangers always accompany great opportunities. The possibility of destruction is always implicit in the act of creation. Thus, the greatest enemy of the individual freedom is the individual himself. From the beginning, the weakness as well as the strength of the democratic ideal has been the people. People cannot be free unless they are willing to sacrifice some of their interests to guarantee the freedom of others. The price of democracy is the ongoing pursuit of the common good by all of the people. 150 years ago, Tocqueville gravely warned that unless individual citizens were regularly involved in the action of governing themselves, self-government would pass from the scene. Citizen participation is the animating spirit and force in a society predicated on voluntarism. We are not here concerned with people who profess the democratic faith but yearn for the dark security of dependency where they can be spared from the burden of yeah, decisions. Sucks. Reluctant to grow up or incapable of doing so, they want to remain children and be cared for by others. Those who can should be encouraged to grow for the others. The fault lies not in the system, but in themselves. Here we are desperately concerned with the vast mass of our people who thwarted through lack of interest or opportunity or both do not participate in the endless responsibilities of citizenship and are resigned to lives determined by others. To lose your identity as a citizen of democracy is but a step from losing your identity as a person. People react to this frustration by not acting at all. The separation of the people from the routine daily functions of citizenship is heartbreak in a democracy. It is a grave situation when a people resign their citizenship or when a resident of a great city, though he may desire to take a hand, lacks the means to participate. That citizen sinks farther into apathy and an anonymity. Anonymity. And, <laughs> and anonymity and depersonalization. The result is that he comes to depend on public authority and a state of civic scolerosis sets in. From time to time, there have been external enemies at our gates. There has always been the enemy within, the hidden and malignant inertia that foreshadows more certain destruction to our life and future than any nuclear warhead. There can be no darker or more devastating tragedy than the death of man's faith in himself and in his power to direct his future. I salute the present generation. Hang on to one of your most precious parts of youth, laughter. Don't lose it as many of you seem to have done. You need it. Together, we may find some of what we're looking for. Laughter, beauty, love, and the chance to create. So that was a lot, so maybe Ooh. we can start from the top and slowly work our way down. I definitely yep. know a certain part that I want to point out. Do you want to start it, or do you want to just go from the top? top? I will say something to give a little more context. So he mentions Tocqueville, and I actually looked up who this person was. So Tocqueville was apparently a French uh, political scientist during the early 19th century. And he basically wrote a book that was called America and Democracy, where he basically analyzed why America's specific form of democracy had worked with, uh, in comparison to the French form of democracy. Oh, shit. So just to give a little... Uh, so that's probably one of Saul Alinsky's inspiration in his uh, well, that, political career. That doesn't necessarily sound so bad i don't think it's supposed to be bad at all well i, I guess he's saying that are we took you warned are we actually on saul alinsky's side until later chapters <laughs> yes uh, all right i would say yes and i'm not i'm yeah i'm not definitely not <laughs> i mean I, I like his weapons but uh I, I don't know if i like where he's pointing the gun i don't like it I am not opposed to 
I don't know. It's, well, there's the questioning of meaning in life and how you find meaning in life and that you have to always be actively participated in something in order to find some sort of meaning, which I disagree with. I think I agree with them on a pragmatic level of if you want to change the world, you have to be very, very smart about it. Um, but at the same time, if you're trying to change the world, you also don't want it to be to the point where you suddenly being yeah, dishonest. That's, that's where that um, being a rhetorical radical comes into play. That's why I agree with his yep. uh, takes, basically, because I do live in a country that requires a lot of, of um, reformation and, well, well, yeah, r r I, I hesitate to call it revolutionary change, but it, it, it would be revolutionary, uh, the, the type of change that we would have to enact. So just, just by that, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I agree. But uh, and in the case of you guys, you, you Americans, I don't think that uh, you uh, require such, uh, su such an extreme action to, to solve your mm -hmm. problems, per se. <laughs> so I, I can see why you aren't as as um, willing to to take on this this tactics, well, I I'm not necessarily in disagreement with the way that the tactics are put forth in this prologue. Like it's it's saying like have your shit be based in reality rather than you know what we're seeing right now. Um okay. Not going to go into current events. No, I disagree. I disagree with you, Happy. Like, it's not saying have your shit based in reality. It's saying stop doing stupid shit and start doing effective shit. That's what he's saying. But. True. I, he's, saying, I, I, hey, he's saying, hey, calling people stupid makes you look stupid. How is that not based in reality? But, no, okay, but he said. What he's giving you is not. He's not saying like, "Oh, like uh, go oh, forth with the okay. truth and like change okay. the world." I no, got he's you. Saying, I got you. He's saying, uh, "Use these tactics, and you'll get effective results." I, I think uh, in the previous passage where he suggests to take the world as it is, I think that's what Alex is talking about. Is that it has to be. Uh, grounded in mm -hmm. reality first before you mm -hmm. take on a, I guess what you would call, a certain uh, action. Is, yeah, is that right, it's Alex? like you can't make up this whole new definition of racism, for example. Where it's just like, ah, oh, well, I, I guess it doesn't look like there's much racism anymore, and I want to be outraged about something, so let's redefine what racism actually is. So that I have something to be outraged well, about. Well, let me tell you. Right. Well, mm -hmm. let me let me just say this. Just because he's saying, base your, like, what was it that you said, Garth? Like, the, what was what was the passage that said based in reality? So I mean, I could, if you want to talk a little bit, I could find it quickly. Uh, 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 oh, well, if it's another, if it's another page, don't worry about it. What I mean is that, it re it, saying that. To base something in reality, it's not telling you to like use the truth. It's telling you to like be realistic. Uh, I don't know what that means. The, I think it means like understand the system that you're working in, because if you come in with a uh, with a wrench trying to turn a screw, you're not going to get very far. You're just going to end up breaking something because you're just trying to trying to use your tools incorrectly right um, or the wrong tool for the job completely so um, making sure that you understand the system that you're in is critical if you actually want to make any change to it because you might as well be a, a monkey trying to fix a helicopter hmm. I think yeah you're totally right but again like what I'm saying is that just because he's telling you like to be realistic about what you're gonna do, that doesn't mean that what you're gonna do is positive or the truth. Like you could be a complete maniac and be realistic as to how you're gonna to achieve it. 
I, hmm, I guess, I mean, it's, I mean, in matters of those, it's always really hard to know. Um, I mean, uh, just having skipped through a couple pages, I couldn't find it, and I apologize. But um, he does talk about how the young generation feels chaotic in a sense. So he sympathizes in the sense that he is trying to bring some order to things. And one of the ways that you have to do that is you have to be able to observe the world, so to speak, in, in, in some way or fashion. Hmm. I, I don't... So in a way, it's like... I, I do get that it's agenda-driven, and it, there is some definite truth to that, um, as he is trying to make a rhetorical uh, radical or... But in, in, in the sense, it's, uh, I don't know. He's, it's also trying, it's also in the sake of trying to put things in order. It, if that makes, if I'm, that makes any sense. I, I'm, I'm wrestling. Yeah, it does. That, that's all I can say. I'm wrestling. It, it, ugh. Do we want to go to a different part of this? Uh, I want to. Yeah, I'd like to. to. End yeah, okay. Yeah. So that I can go to. Sleep. I think near the part that starts uh, here, we're deeply concerned with the vast mass of our people who thwarted through lack of interest or opportunity both do not participate in the endless responsibilities of citizenship. I mean, it doesn't really matter because, uh, like, I kind of agree with them here. There are people. Who are like, oh, it doesn't matter. Fifty percent of the people are gonna get what they want, and I mean, forty-nine percent aren't, and fifty-one percent will get what they want. It's like, you know, I I do see that as an issue. There are people that are like, oh, it doesn't matter, and I can, for one, agree with them on that. Like, we need to mm. get people interested, and I think maybe what we could do is, you know, you know, help people regain their identity. As citizens, I think, I think that's just something he's kind of on about. And that's like mm -hmm. the positive of yep. democracy, right? Is that yeah. you have a people that are feel yep. somewhat integrated with society because they vote on things. The downside is that in a democracy, you potentially face the tyranny yes. of the majority. Right. Yep. Which is why we have people represent uh, certain areas of our country. Yeah, that's right. why we have the oh electoral my gosh, college I'm not in the first get... place. Oh, I just had an argument with somebody about the existence of the electoral college, and oh, well, really? she didn't understand why oh, it existed. No. <laughs> I'm like, you need to understand that you're going <laughs> uh -oh. to have a majority of people within one area. You can't have that majority of people just be because of the density dictating. What should happen for the people who are, say, uh, producing the food for that majority? Like, they're a minority because they are right, the less way. densely populated. She she just didn't get it. Uh, maybe I did a right. very bad job of describing it right. as well. It's, it's, it's exactly how you described it. It's to protect, it's to have the minority have a voice. Not... Right. Yeah, because otherwise, the pure democracy Yeah, is you don't just want mob, mob rule. rule. That's just scary. Oh, well, man, I had a really current event topic, but I just remembered it's current event, so I should bring it up. Okay, well, maybe the best, be the best way to explain to your friend why it's necessary is because you have to think about the United States as 50 countries. And you don't want one city or two cities in two of the countries to be I, speaking for I the entire 50 countries. Yes. Which is basically uh, New York City and LA. Tried it. <laughs> well, gonna, is going to say, oh, you guys, you guys in the mountains, you guys need to like have socialized men or whatever it is, like gun control or whatever. Well, meanwhile, you're living in I, fucking bear country I think or whatever. We eventually did come to some form of conclusion at the end of it. I, let's go. Let's go. I, or if anybody else wants to say anything. I so I found the passage that I was referencing earlier. Um, this is from previously in the prologue that we accept the world as it 
as it is, does not in any sense weaken our desire to change it into what we believe it should be. So that's from Saul Alinsky. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's what I mean by uh, knowing reality doesn't mean that you want to fight for the truth. And I, say, I think it says this right there. Says, well, can you read it again? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. That we accept the world as it is does not in any sense weaken our desire to change it into what we believe it should be. Exactly. So he's telling you, okay, recognize the world, right? The reality of the world and change it to what you believe in, right? What you believe in is not necessarily the truth or what's best. Well, that's, that's a deep <laughs> philosophical question. But I mean, I mean, in the sense yeah. that, um, I mean, it's almost an is on is that he's trying to, well, actually, no, because it, he's, he's trying to get it in the context of, I mean, whatever it is. So it's like, okay, so you want pollution to be gone and pollution you. is bad. Therefore, part of that equation is you have to know what the world is. Like, it's just inherently part of it, I think is what he's trying to say. Right, right. Well, I I, know, I, re I don't remember what why we were talking about uh, reality versus the truth, but uh, damn it, I forgot. I lost my train of thought. I think because when he says should be, that's a moral statement. Yeah, like if you an, say something, an, it should be something. Uh, that is inherently a moral statement. So I think I think it's just a difference of what what it should be, and then how do you come to the truth of what things should be which is uh, kind of like an objective moralism in a sense. Yeah. Hmm. And maybe that's kind of maybe that's kind of his um, his warning for the people that are going to be reading this book and and seeing the tactics presented. Um, maybe it's so he doesn't pass this off onto people that are willing to abandon reality and still use these tactics for uh, detriment because um, I mean being a radical it, this you know when you hand this type of power to a radical you better damn sure make know that at least in your own mind when you write it you're not giving the power to say the next Hitler because you know, this is as we kind of have yeah. come so far to tell this could be used by anybody that that wants radical change. So uh, living in reality is kind of a kill switch for it, just in case someone gets uh, out of their mind and starts using this for evil. Uh, right, but right. you can't say you can't equate reality with to a truth because you know. <laughs> Could like some people live in reality and still could assert like you, weird could you stuff rephrase that about the world? You can't equate reality with truth. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can't because reality is the way things are, but oh, truth oh, can okay, be. Oh, okay, other... okay. Depends on definition of, of truth. Perception. All right. Here, 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 here's what I could say. I would say that uh, the way like That's... reality is truth. But truth is not reality. The way I like uh, to say it is that I there disagree. is the truth, but there can be a truth. Like, a truth can be someone else's perspective, but the truth is reality. I so, this is why I like this guy. With that statement. Really? I, I think that it's useful to say the truth, like, I... another person's truth, but... That is just uh, part of. We're gonna go truth. Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson. I mean, I... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so about this last paragraph here, um, <laughs> I do like. I I find it very interesting that he is actually very focused on the the individual, yeah. so to speak, in the sense that he wants the individual to be able to participate in the democratic function of our society. Are you talking about this paragraph right here? One above it. Oh, okay, this one? Yes. Okay. 
And I, man, and he doesn't go the, uh, you know, uh, bottle from the government approach. Um, it's, it's like, a, you know, it's, no, he, he, in a sense, he recognizes that, no, you have to participate in a society some way. And that doesn't just mean to being, uh, you know, constantly being fed by the government in a sense. I think part of, part of the lack of interest or opportunity is based in the corruption of government. That's, I, I just think that's part of the thing. Mm. Oh well. Uh, say it again. Ah, oh, no. Yeah, I think you cut out. Desperately concerned with the vast, <clears throat> excuse me, mass of our people who are thwarted through lack of interest or opportunity. Well, yeah, I I think the the interest and in opportunity is based in in government, like I don't know how to describe it. I would I would no, too... opportunity. I could probably agree with. Lack yeah. of interest, though, you that's know, something you're, that's you're very subjective. Right. Because some could have a lack of interest in something okay, for a so multitude of different Let's reasons. say you... I don't know. I think I just shot myself in the foot there with my own thought before I even said it. So you have a government that's okay. that has a little bit too much control. You're going to lose interest in that. I don't think that makes sense. That, my my thought that is, because of course you're going to be interested in a government that has too much control. But if you don't have the opportunity to to change it in any substantial way, like say the upcoming election that we've got, what what are you going to do with the lesser evil? Really? Of course you're going to lose interest. Right. Right. <laughs> I don't, actually, interesting thought. Would you say that this happened because... Well, actually, no. I, I don't know about that. I, hmm. Go on. In regards to the previous election, I would have to really think about that. History because has shown that people for, uh, forgo their freedom in exchange yes. for safety, right? So um, people are willing to sort of... Um, accept the highly controlling government if they feel threatened by an outside what force when the threat yes. is the government 100%. well that's when okay. revolution that's happens yep, exactly yeah. that's when you get uh that's when this All book right. comes in yeah <laughs> fair enough. radicals fair enough. yeah and yeah, again, this this book could work for anyone, any political side or whatever. Yeah, it's what I'm sort of looking. It's how how I am looking at at it because, you know, presently in Mexico we have a a very, mm, well, mm, uh, useless lefty government, and and uh, but but the the opposition is well. It's 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 hated. It's it's completely hated. So uh, I, I would urge people to to use these tactics in order to sort of build a, a base and build a a center. Yeah, just to sort of um, change things for the better. In in this in my own in my own case. Hmm. Did... But. Well, maybe maybe it'll serve good in Mexico, but in a country, in my opinion, as well structured as America, like I don't think fucking with the system is a good thing necessarily. And it's, and, and it's oh. what I what I was saying. I'm sorry. That's what I was I was saying that that your you guys are are don't I don't think you you need such an extreme uh, yes. solution. Yes, <laughs> I'm not sure if. Well, right, right. I'm I'm not exactly from a different country, but 
it, things work differently here in Puerto Rico, right? So we also have a problem with let's make it fifty-one, government man. Here, but I won't say I don't. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Uh, that even looking for a solution in America is appropriate. I think, you know, like you guys have a problem looking for a, or a solution looking for a problem. Is what I'm trying to say. Over there, I think in some parts maybe. Um, yeah, I don't. Hmm. I'd have to think about it because. Yeah, it's like yeah. It, it all has to do with what is the like again. I go. I go back to Solinsky. What is the world right now? Are you willing to accept? Like, how do you accept the world as it is? And then you have to go therefore because if you don't, then we get a lot of. Because I think that's a lot of questions that are getting asked recently. Is what is actually going on here? So like with uh, current events, sorry, but with police brutality, it's like what is it, what is the act? What is the problem? And be. what is actually it should happening? be. But it's not. <clears throat> You're getting knee-jerk reactions. It it is this yes. rather than the nature of reality. I I guess that comes back to truth. The way that you know Sam Harris, uh, Jordan Peterson, that whole thing, like um, versus reality. I still view truth as the nature of reality. I I see it as. Uh, in the Jonathan Peugeot uh, form, like truth is the logos. The logos is the nature of reality. I I don't view truth right. subjectively. It can be taken subjectively. Right. Or... Right. Right. Well, I mean, I I guess there is a re like. I guess the way that I would phrase it is that yes, there is a reality truth, and there is also a subjective truth, a truth that I have of my own, that I am thinking so the thoughts T. that I am thinking. In a sense. Uh, sure, yes. I would actually do it. I would actually, well, whatever doesn't even matter. I mean, this is. I mean, this is a lot of Kierkegaard type <laughs> stuff because Kierkegaard <laughs> uh, talks a lot about the uh, the the uh, subjective God. truth so to speak it's right. a lot of God psychological of stuff existentialism yep how are we right. doing here well, where are we at i want to wrap this up it's we're we're, we're going on 5 hours we're now. at the end okay oh, all right i i am we're satisfied i'm satisfied you guys. as fuck i'm good I actually have one more thought, but it's a little off. I bet it, man. Go for it. Just maybe, maybe when you guys are kind of losing your like, you're just trying to thought. Mm -hmm. You guys are losing what you're thinking. Maybe you guys are thinking faster <laughs> than the speed of time. <laughs> oh, Bruh. oh my god! And then it tell it like that thought warps into the past <laughs> or future, so then you can think it later. Oh my god! Well, I mean, um, the, the brain waves and thoughts are are tra do travel through energy so you never know uh, uh, this this is why psycho made all right well, well this we'll guy call. this guy certainly we knows how to end a right. freaking dun, 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 a podcast oh dun, my gosh dun, 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 dun. There, there's a, a brain teaser for y'all what's the speed of, of, of what of time yeah that it's yeah that's the speed the, of time what's the speed of time y'all uh, anyone, who, anyone who answers that question, Alex will give that person $10. Damn, I, I already, 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 already saw 10 bucks. It's... Yeah, it's we already solved it. If you want to slow down time, just blank. Well, plug your everybody, everybody three. involved. Goodbye. Everybody involved. Bye -bye. Thank you so much for joining. Bye -bye. Thank you for contributing. It was really nice to have Enlightened Centrist yeah. in here. It was really nice to have uh, Phalanx in for a little bit. I think that this was mind-blowingly long, but... <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm satisfied. Jeez. All right, everybody. Thank you for... Uh... Thank you for joining. Yeah, it probably does. Thank you, everybody who's contributed. This Glad has to be been here. a fantastic time. Um. Bye bye.
Subscribe to the fucking channel. Oh. Subscribe. I don't know.